I'm sitting outside enjoying a glass of shandy in the warm April sun. As I breathe in the morning air, my scar begins to itch. It's not a big scar, about three inches long, just above the waist on the left side of the back. When I start scratching it, it all suddenly comes back, reminding me where lies and deceit can lead. Susan and I have been married for 17 years, and we have been happy most of the time. She gave me three wonderful children, Alex, Maddie, and Jacob. Susan is four years older than me. She is attractive, not dazzlingly beautiful, but most men will definitely turn to her. She has a slim figure, great legs, and a personality that can warm up any room. One of the things that particularly attracted me to Susan was her love for children. Although I often joked to the contrary, I really wanted to be a father. When we got married, Susan was 25. Her biological clock was ticking. In those days, it was believed that if you had not started starting a family by 30, then you should already consider adoption. After 18 months of trying, Susan was still unable to conceive, so we began consulting with specialists. At this time, all our friends had already started having children, and they were all younger than Susan. One of my friends, Gary Dawson, got his girlfriend pregnant, and they had to get married. All of Susan's tests came back normal. Then it was my turn, and here it was, a difficult test. Old Harry Anderson, who loves children so much, turned out to have very bad readings, and the likelihood that I would be able to have children was extremely small. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't give the woman I love what she wanted more than anything else. I would understand if she left me, but my Susan was not like that. She made a promise to be there through thick and thin, and she was going to keep it. Whether someone said something or just because we tried for so long, I'll never know. But my friends started joking about how we still didn't have kids. Gary Dawson was especially cruel. His wife Sarah was already expecting their second child. Every time I saw him, he started bragging. I just have to look at a woman and she's already pregnant. If you need any help, Harry, let me know. Your Susan is certainly not Sarah, but I wouldn't go through her to get to you, haha. -ha. I was often on the verge of punching him in that grinning face. We began to look at options for artificial insemination and adoption and decided to move forward in this direction. And then one day a miracle happened. Susan called me at work to tell me she had just seen the doctor and she was definitely pregnant. Of course we were delighted and Susan glowed like an expectant mother. I worked overtime and by the time Alex was born, we had already set up his nursery. What do they say about buses? You wait forever for him and then three come at once. This happened with our children. Two years later we had Maddie and a year later we had Jacob. It turned out that old Harry Anderson wasn't so barren after all. We were as happy as we could be. After Jacob, we decided that three was enough. We never thought much about protection, but now Susan has decided to start taking the pills. We had our ups and downs, but we can safely say that there were more ups. This happiness could not last forever, and right after Alex turned 14, our world collapsed. One day, returning from school, he stepped off the sidewalk directly under the wheels of a large SUV. He was taken to the hospital, and we were told that he had several broken ribs, a severe blow to the head and serious bruises in the kidney area. Things could have been much worse, and Susan and I supported each other through these troubling times. I was now working for myself, developing control systems and consulting in the telecommunications industry. I had a tight deadline, so we organized a shift at the hospital. Susan was on duty during the day so I could work from home, and I relieved her at 4 p.m. and stayed until midnight when she returned for night duty. Meanwhile, her mother looked after the younger children. After a few days, I realized that something was wrong. Susan only told me fragmentary details of what the doctors were saying, and I felt like she was hiding something from me. When I arrived for my shift, I asked her directly what was happening with our son. It turned out that after being hit by an SUV, both kidneys stopped functioning. Doctors tried to stimulate their work, but to no avail. Dialysis was an option, but it didn't work for everyone. The hospital put Alex on a waiting list for a kidney transplant. I didn't worry about it. Problem solved, he can have one of mine. Susan burst into tears and through her sobs said, 
Oh, Harry, I knew you would say this, but it's not that simple. I tried to reassure her, and then she explained that tests would first need to be done to determine if the tissue was suitable for grafting. She had already taken the test and was waiting for the result. Okay, I said. Who should I contact to get tested? They'll check you first, she replied. The best chances of a match are with blood relatives on the maternal side. I've already taken the test. Maddie and Jacob are still too young. For the first time in 17 years, I felt like Susan was lying to me, and I didn't know why. Susan went home to get some rest, and I stayed sitting next to Alex. He didn't look well, his body seemed swollen from all the fluids the doctors had given him, and he was only conscious for short periods. That evening there was a medical emergency on the ward, and I saw one of the doctors rush into the room. I decided to wait for him and find out what was going on. To be honest, he looked like he hadn't slept in days, and when I approached him, he wasn't in the best of spirits, to put it mildly. He told me that he had already explained everything to my wife, that Alex really needed a transplant, and that the best chance of a match was with blood relatives. Your wife has already taken the test, and I asked her to call the boy's father so that he can also take the test. But it's me, doctor. I'm Alex's father. Oh, no, he replied. I mean, it's great that you think so, but we need his biological father from your wife's first marriage. I was so shocked that I just stood there and watched him leave. I tried to call Susan several times that night, but each time there was no answer. By the time she arrived for her shift, I had already decided not to raise this issue right away. I mentioned that I tried to call her, and she said that she was in the garden and then went to see her mother. Another lie I already called there. I went home, but couldn't sleep. The question kept popping up in my head. Why is she lying about some past marriage? The only explanation that came to mind was that Alex was not my son, and she knew it. The next day I finished the project I was working on and sent the report to the client. I called them and told them I wouldn't be able to give the presentation for at least a week, but offered to show the results to the technicians so they could prepare questions for the meeting. This freed me up for the whole day. That afternoon I returned to the hospital at four o'clock. Susan was devastated and her test came back negative. Then I thought, only the boy's father remains. Was she the one who went to see him last night? I consoled her as best I could and told her to go home and rest. I knew deep down she had no intention of going home. I walked her to the hospital door and then ran to my car. In her condition, she would hardly have noticed me, even if I was driving right behind her. I was right, she didn't go home. Instead, she went to a new residential area on the outskirts of the city. She parked near one of the houses and just sat in the car. I stopped about 200 meters behind and watched. She didn't come out for more than an hour. Just when I started to think that nothing would happen, a black pickup truck pulled into the driveway in front of the house. Susan got out of the car and quickly walked towards the truck. I recognized the driver immediately. I hadn't seen him in years, and time hadn't been kind to him, but as soon as he stood up, I knew it was Gary Bloody Dawson. I felt sick of all people. Did she choose him? Susan walked up to the car and spoke to Gary. I saw him shake his head several times, and then Susan knelt down. My God, she begged him. He tried to leave, but she held him by the pants. At that moment I saw him raise his hand. I took off from my car, racing at full speed, closing the distance between us. But he never hit Susan. Someone appeared at the side door and called out to him. Gary turned and walked away, leaving Susan kneeling in the driveway. Slowly she stood up and walked to her car while I headed to mine. She sat in the car for another ten minutes before starting the engine and driving away. I drove to pick her up to make sure she was heading home and then drove back to the hospital. I sat next to Alex, talking to him when he was conscious and thinking when he was asleep. One thing was clear, he was not getting better. When Susan returned to the hospital she looked terrible as if she had been crying all evening and all hope was lost. Even though I knew, I still couldn't stop myself from hugging her and telling her that everything would be okay. I stayed with her almost the whole night. 
we sat hugging each other and discussing possible options. I left the hospital around 3 o'clock in the morning and went home. That night I realized that whatever I decided to do, I couldn't do it while Alex remained in the hospital. The next day, when the emotions had subsided a little, I began to think more clearly. I went up to the attic and started looking for old photographs. After some time, I found several photographs of our old company, with whom we were friends in our youth. Of course, Gary was on some of them. I also found Alex's school photo and compared them. Same eyes, similar nose and eyebrows, he had Susan's lips, but his chin was sharper than both of us. To my unprofessional eye, this seemed obvious. I also found a photo of Susan, taken shortly before her first pregnancy, in which she was wearing a bikini, obviously a vacation shot. Looking at her, I felt a warm feeling in my chest. God, she was beautiful, not a model beauty, but with that look that makes you want to protect her from all the troubles of life. I took the photos downstairs and put them under the lid of my scanner for later use. Then I sat down at the table and called my brother Bob. He and his wife had a spare room and I was hoping to move in there temporarily. I told him that Susan and I were going through a difficult time and I wanted to give her some space as soon as Alex got out of the hospital. He seemed to believe it, said that he would talk to his wife, but was sure that she would agree. When I arrived at the hospital, both Alex and Susan looked much more alert. He had his first dialysis session and everything went well. Susan looked at me and said, We need to talk. Would you like to have coffee with me? I thought, This is it. Now she will tell me the whole truth and reveal this dirty story to me. I was wrong. As we sat and drank coffee, she began to tell me about dialysis and how, when the patient gets used to the procedure and can do it himself, he can have the equipment installed at home. But for this, you need a separate room. She asked if I was ready to give up my office. I was disappointed she continued to support the lie. Yes, no problem, I said, knowing that by then I would no longer be there. That evening went well. Alex felt much better. He was still in bandages from his broken ribs, and it still hurt to laugh, but he was starting to look more like the son I knew again. He fell asleep by 10 p.m., and I took out my laptop and made a to-do list. Open a personal bank account, buy a new phone, talk to a lawyer, pack your things, kill Gary. Susan stayed late that night and didn't arrive until 1 o'clock in the morning. She looked better than she had in the entire past week and seemed to have finally gotten some sleep. I went home and got real sleep for the first time in three days. I was woken up by a call at half past ten in the morning, it was my brother. Yes, they would be happy to accommodate me, and could they do anything to help Susan and I improve our relationship? I thanked him and asked if I could start moving my things around 5 p.m. He agreed, and I let him get back to work. By the end of the day, I had already opened a personal account and transferred a third of the money from our joint accounts to it. I bought a new phone and started transferring contacts to it. I also made an appointment with a lawyer the next day. When I arrived at my brother's and started unloading my things, he was a little surprised. Wait, Harry, that's too much stuff for several days. You're going back, aren't you? I don't know, Bob. I just don't know, but I'll have to work from here for a while, if that's okay. He said it was no problem, and I went to the hospital. When I got there, both Susan and Alex were in good spirits and didn't even complain that I was late. Alex was feeling much better, and Susan decided to spend the night at home in our shared bed. Harry, when he falls asleep, comes home. You look terribly tired. I returned home around 11 and, using her own excuse, went straight to bed. I was sleeping. I was awakened by the smell of bacon and the news that breakfast was on the table. When I arrived at the table, Susan was like old times bright, cheerful, full of energy. Over breakfast, she told me that Alex would have dialysis again today, then on Monday, and if everything went well, he could be sent home, and he would come for treatments three times a week until we installed the machine at home. She thanked me for agreeing to give up my office, finished her coffee, and hurried to the hospital. I pulled out my laptop and looked at my to-do list again. There are only two points left. Talk to the lawyer and kill Gary. Well, the first point was in progress, 
so I could move on to the second. I didn't know if I could actually kill him. I have never in my life wanted someone to die, but I have never been in such a state as I am now. It felt like my whole life was ruined and none of this would have happened if it weren't for Gary Dawson. I wanted to take his life the same way he took mine. I had no experience killing people, but from the movies, the first step was to study their daily movements. With that thought in mind, I drove to Gary's house. When I pulled up to the house, his pickup truck was in the driveway. All my calmness instantly evaporated. This bastard got my wife pregnant and then turned his back on my son at the most important moment. He deserved what was coming, and the best time to do it was now. I got out of the car and headed to the front door. I rang the bell, and the door opened almost immediately. What I saw unsettled me. Standing in front of me was a woman about five feet eight inches tall, graceful, brunette with blue eyes. She wore tight light blue jeans and a plaid cotton shirt that was tied around her stomach, leaving part of her waist visible. How can I help? she asked. My anger returned and I demanded to see Gary. Unfortunately, you can't. He's not at home. Then she looked at me intently and added, Wait a minute, you're Harry, right? Harry Anderson? God, it's been so long, Harry, come in. Sorry, I didn't recognize you. Who are you? I asked. Sarah, Harry, Gary's wife. Sarah, sorry, I didn't recognize you. All so grown up, she interrupted me, spinning in place with her hands raised. Well, tell me, how do you like it? I really like it, I admitted honestly. Fine, sit down, I'll make some coffee. I sat down on the sofa, feeling that all my passion had disappeared. I came here to kill Gary, not to hurt this miracle. She returned with a tray containing coffee, cream, sugar, and cookies. She sat down opposite me on the sofa, tucked one leg under her, and without looking away, poured coffee. Harry, did Gary do something bad to you? She asked. Why do you think so? When I opened the door, I saw a man in front of me who had real hatred in his eyes. That's why I didn't recognize you right away. The Harry Anderson I knew was a kind and gentle man who never hated anyone. Why did you come here, Harry? I came to kill him, I said completely calmly. Wow, you must hate him even more than I do. What did he do to you, Harry? I saw a chance to avoid answering and asked. Why do you hate him? Is he hitting you? I used to hit you, Harry, but not anymore. Not since my father saw this and sent someone to talk to Gary. Since then, he hasn't even laid a finger on me. It sounds like it was a serious conversation. Oh, yes. Now he's the one who's afraid. She returned to the question again. What did he do to you, Harry? Her eyes were not the eyes of an inquisitor. They were warm, tender, and compassionate. I couldn't stand it and burst into tears, telling her the whole story. When I finished, she came closer and pulled my head to her chest, hugging me. When I got to the part where Susan was literally begging Gary to take the fabric compatibility test, she interrupted me. Was it Susan? I wouldn't recognize her. I thought it was one of his girlfriends. If he had hit her, dear Harry, he would already be dead, she said with a smile. Like I said, it's not me who's afraid of him now. I sobbed, and she held me tightly on her chest. It was only when I began to calm down that I realized how nice it felt to be in her arms. When I calmed down, she raised my head, took it in her hands, and looked at me. At that moment I thought, God, she's beautiful. You need to start thinking like Harry Anderson. You were always the smartest guy in our group. That's why you didn't fit in. Killing Gary won't help you, will it? This will only make the situation worse. What will Susan and the kids do when you go to jail? Her words hit the mark, and I realized that she was right. This was the same girl that all our friends called empty-headed, and Gary called her his stupid girl all these years, but how wrong they were. She made fresh coffee, and we continued talking. When I looked at my watch, I saw that it was almost time for my visit to the lawyer. When I got up to leave, she walked me to the door. Harry, Gary will be home all weekend, and the kids will be home from school. 
Do you promise that you will come on Monday morning? We can discuss everything and make a plan. Then she kissed me, not passionately, but tenderly, with warmth. Of course, I promised to return. What man wouldn't agree? When I was about to leave, she pulled my head back and kissed me again. When we broke the kiss, she smiled at me. This is so that you definitely come back on Monday. The lawyer said the case seemed simple. If I filed for divorce due to infidelity, I would have to do DNA tests to prove that I was not the father of the children. Otherwise, we can use the information Susan gave to the doctors to show that she did not believe I was Alex's father and that the deception led to an unresolved conflict. I told him that the second option seemed better to me. I had no desire to disgrace Susan, and I certainly didn't want the children to think badly of her. I also said that I was not ready to take action until Alex left the hospital. The weekend flew by. During the day I was working on a new project and preparing a presentation for a project I had just completed. In the evenings I would come to Alex, sit with him until he fell asleep, and then return home. On Sunday, Susan finally got some sleep and felt like herself again, to the point where she asked what happened when I tried to go to bed. It's been over two weeks since we made love. While we were awake at the same time, she could understand why, but now that I was home, she couldn't understand why I was avoiding her. Monday morning at 9.30 and I was ringing Sarah's doorbell. As soon as the door opened, her hand pulled me by my shirt and pulled me inside. When she closed the door, she pressed me against it. You're late, she said before kissing me passionately, just like she did on Friday. I tried to say something about being late, but she didn't listen to me, took my hand and led me to the kitchen. She was wearing jeans that looked like they had been poured onto her body, a thin white t-shirt, three-inch stilettos, and a playful smile. I have a plan, she said. Coffee or something stronger. I agreed to coffee, and she led me back to the couch. She brought coffee and a bag and sat down next to me. Do you still want to hurt Gary? she asked. I'm not sure, maybe not as much as Friday, but I think he should pay for all the pain he caused and the destruction of my marriage. Now think about it, Harry. What is Gary most proud of? What did he always say when he bullied you? With your sexual power, the ability to conquer women like you, and now, as it turns out, Susan. So that's where we're going to hit him. The second part of the plan is more difficult, but hitting his self-confidence will be much easier than you think. Now I need to know the answer to two questions. First of all, in order to carry out our plan, you and I will have to get to know each other a lot better, and I mean a lot better. Are you ready for this, Harry? One look at her as she moved closer to me answered this question. Yes, definitely. Great, she said, taking something out of her bag. Now the second question, do you know how to use this? She pulled out a Sony digital semi-professional video camera with a Zoom microphone. What I don't know, I can quickly learn, I replied. Oh, great, she said, grabbing my hand and moving even closer. Harry, we're going to make a movie starring you and me. You will do everything to me that Gary hasn't done in years and some things that I never let him do. We could send this to all his friends. It would destroy him. Wait a minute. Now who doesn't think about the consequences? Can you imagine what a shame this is for you? Wouldn't it be unpleasant for you to do all this on camera? Wasn't it shameful and humiliating to be married to this non-entity all these years? If it weren't for my father's insistence that children need a father, I would have left long ago. Plus, we don't have to spread it. We can just threaten, you know, blackmail. You could get a kidney for your son. If I were in my right mind, I would have seen all the flaws in her plan. But she caught me on the last phrase, and I agreed. So, Harry, the first stage of the plan is for us to get to know each other better. Follow me. She led me upstairs to the master bedroom. What's next? I asked. Well, Harry, now you undress me, then we will make love, talk, make love again, and so on, until I have to pick up the children from school, and you have to go to the hospital. Who knows, if you're a good boy, I might even make you lunch, she added with a playful smile. I didn't need any more encouragement. Susan had already broken our marriage vows. I thought I was free.
She looked at me with love in her eyes and said, Thank you, Harry. For what? For helping me understand why it's called making love. With Gary and other lovers, sex was something one person did to another to satisfy their needs, and now it was like an act of love. I've never felt anything like this. Will it always be like this, Harry? I don't know, I replied. I'll try. Yes, she laughed. I believe it. Now I'll tell you everything about myself, and then you'll tell me everything about yourself. She said she had a privileged childhood, with her father owning several local companies, including the trucking firm where Gary worked. She thought she must have been a spoiled child. Her father, although generous with his money, was not generous with his time and expected his children to do as they were told without question. She chose Gary as her boyfriend only because she knew her father would be against it. Unfortunately, Gary turned out to be exactly the non-entity her father thought he was. He brought her to a party and got her drunk. She didn't even remember how it happened. She was about to break up with Gary when she discovered she was pregnant. In those days, it was taken much more seriously than it is now. Her father insisted that she marry Gary. You made this bed yourself, now you have to lie in it, he told her. Gary wasn't happy, so her father made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Gary was promised job security and would never have to pay a penny to support Sarah and their child. All he had to do was be a good husband. Gary, of course, didn't know how to be a good husband, and even when she was in the hospital giving birth to their child, he went to clubs with friends and met girls. I knew this for sure because at that time I was still communicating with the same company. Three months after the baby was born, she was pregnant again. It wasn't an easy pregnancy, but Gary didn't care and demanded that she satisfy his sexual needs, no matter how she felt. She felt not like his wife, but like his personal toy. Having said this, she looked at me. Sorry, Harry. For what? I think I remember that you don't like it when women express themselves that way, but I couldn't find a better way to say it. I was amazed that she remembered it after all these years. You're right, I said, but keep going. She said that after the birth of her daughter, she learned that Gary visited women of easy virtue during her pregnancy. That's when she decided to fight back. Those years were the height of the hype around illnesses, and she would never let Gary pass something like that on to her. She refused to have sex without protection. This led to physical violence. One day, after one of their fights, she went home to her mother. Her father saw her and simply asked, Did he do it? Her silence was quite eloquent. She quickly realized that all she had to do was mention that she had spoken to her father to make Gary turn pale and start sweating. Gary did the procedure in an attempt to get her to agree to have sex without protection. It didn't work and when he said that with protection he didn't have to have sex, she said she was fine with that. His employer gave him an assignment on the Turkish route, which kept him away from home for seven days at a time. She told me about her lovers and expected me to be shocked, but I wasn't. I didn't ask how many there were, but she said they could be counted on the fingers of one hand. Most of them ended up being married, and they all wanted her just for her body, avoiding any complications. I told her it was their loss, and I truly meant it. The more I got to know her, the more I realized that she was actually a good person who just had bad luck. She obviously adored her children, Luke and Daisy. They were part of the reason she was still with Gary. Having become pregnant early, she did not have the skills to get a job that would support the family, and her father made it clear that if she left, he would not support them. When she finished, she looked at me. Do you see what a mess my life is, Harry? I just hugged her. Why me? What why you, Harry? Well, you said that no one has approached you without protection for over ten years. This is true. But I didn't use it, and you didn't ask. So why me? Because you are Harry Anderson. Boring, unable to conceive Harry Anderson, I replied. She slapped me on the chest, stood up on her elbow, and looked at me. I told you about self-pity, Harry. It's extremely unattractive in a man. Okay, she continued, because Harry Anderson has always been faithful to his wife since their wedding day, so there is no chance of infection. Because if Harry Anderson impregnates me, 
He will be by my side no matter what happens. If that makes you boring, Harry, then I'm happy to be boring. Oh, how I wish I had met you before that bastard got me drunk and got me pregnant. We got dressed, we went down to the kitchen and Sarah asked what I would like to eat. Knowing her privileged upbringing, I returned to my worker peasant roots and asked for a bacon sandwich. While we ate, I told her my story about a guy who grew up on the outskirts of the city, the son of a farm worker and a cleaner. My studies are in a regular school. I told how I had to work to buy records, photographic film, and so on. I delivered newspapers, stocked supermarket shelves, anything that could bring in money. My love for science and mathematics made me strange in the eyes of my peers. I told her how I had transferred to a technical college to study engineering, and the other kids laughed and said that I needed to get a real job in construction or as a delivery driver to make real money. When I went to university to study electronics, they went completely crazy, claiming that I thought I was too good for them. However, I would return during the holidays and work where they paid, still dealing with the same old company. When I returned with a degree in electronics engineering, I got a job at a local engineering plant. I had only been working for six months when I met Susan, who was working as a children's social worker. I told her about our difficulties conceiving and how we rejoiced at the birth of Alex and then Maddie and Jacob. She listened to all this and then said, So you were happy, Harry? Yes, I admitted, but it was all a lie. For fourteen years I lived a lie, thinking that I was the most important person in their lives. And now I find out that Susan slept with Gary and God knows who else. I thought she loved me, but if that was the case, why did she do this to me? It would have been much kinder to leave as soon as she realized that I couldn't give her children. She pressed my head to her chest. God, how they hurt you, Harry. Before I left, she made me promise to come back the next day. By the time we finished talking, it was time for her to pick up the kids from school and for me to go to the hospital. I arrived at the hospital earlier than expected and immediately noticed that Susan was much happier. She told me that Alex was doing well on dialysis and that they were going to send him home after his next session on Wednesday. I said that was wonderful and suggested that she stay home on Wednesday to prepare the house for his return. I will stay with him and take him home after treatment. I also said that I had a meeting with clients on Thursday to present them with a new project. Of course it was a lie, but I decided that I could arrange a meeting so that the lie would become the truth. In fact, I just wanted to see her as little as possible until the day I left for good, which I planned for Friday. Before leaving, Susan asked me not to stay at the hospital today. I'll have a real dinner ready by eight and we'll have dinner together, she said. You look very tired. I think you work too much. When I arrived, Alex was sitting in a chair and watching TV. He said that the programs on TV were boring and instead started asking me about work. After talking, he suddenly said, Dad, you're very good with technology, right? I told him that my clients think so, and in general, I agree with them. Wouldn't you like to sometimes understand people the same way you understand cars? Wow, what a deep question. Yes, sometimes I really think about it. What made you ask? There's something wrong with Mom. When she's not running around me, she just sits and stares at me. She thinks I don't notice, but I see it, and it's scary. It probably just dawned on her how close we were to losing you. I changed the subject and asked how dialysis was going. Terribly boring. You have to sit there for hours while the machine does its thing. By half past eight, I was already on my way home. Whatever I think of Susan, there are two things you can't fault her for. She's a good cook and a wonderful mother. That night, dinner was great. We opened a bottle of wine, and when we sat on the sofa to watch TV, she became very affectionate. I chalked it up to remorse, and the more affectionate she became, the angrier I became. In order not to express my anger, I told her that she was right. I was really very tired and went to bed. In 17 years, I rarely refused her intimate proposals, but this time I had to do it. In this state, I would want to hurt her, and that would be something I couldn't live with, so I tried my best to pretend I was sleeping. 
I woke up alone in bed, smelling bacon wafting from the kitchen. I quickly showered and went downstairs to where a full English breakfast was waiting for me. This usually happened on holidays and important days, so I asked what the reason was for all this. My man needs to gain strength, was all she said, kissing me softly on the lips. I was starting to feel like a jerk for what I was about to do, but then I thought, my lie has only been going on for a few days and I already feel like this. If she really loved me, how could she deceive me for 14 years and not break under the weight of guilt? After breakfast, I immediately went to my office and made two calls. The first was to organize a presentation of my latest project. The second was to a telecommunications company to set up all incoming calls from my work number to be forwarded to the new mobile phone I bought. I thought that this would allow me to work normally, despite the upcoming breakup. Susan hadn't left for the hospital yet and looked really disappointed when I said I needed to meet with a potential client. Can't you just take a vacation? I'm going to the hospital later and was hoping we could spend time together. That's the problem with your own work, I told her. You have to plan ahead for these things. I kissed her on the cheek and said I'll see her later at the hospital. Sarah was ready and waiting for me when I arrived. She took my hand and quickly led me upstairs, heading back to her bedroom. Oh, Harry, you are simply priceless. Susan doesn't understand who she's missing. He'll understand soon, I said. We just lay there for a while. I couldn't imagine a better place on earth that I would rather be. Finally, I asked her, Well, what are we going to do today? Yesterday we told our life stories, so this is no longer an option. She sat up to look at me. No, Harry, we're going to watch some adult videos today. Before I could say anything, she added, well, if we're going to make a movie, we need to study the competition. I couldn't help but laugh. Well, I can't help but agree with your logic. She stood up to put the disc into the player. I stood up and quickly put on my shirt, pants, and shoes. Harry, she said sternly, aren't you running away from me? No, I just have to get something from the car. When I returned with a notepad and pencil, she burst into laughter. What's so funny? You, Harry, are absolutely unique. Your lover just said that you will lie in bed and watch adult videos together, and you go out to get a pencil and paper. Are you going to take notes? That kind of hysterical laughter is contagious, and I realized how funny it was. When she calmed down, I said, Yeah, actually, I'm going to take notes. We both burst into laughter again, hugging each other. Then she said, Fuck the video, Harry. Make love to me right now. I did as she asked. When we recovered, she looked at me with her beautiful blue eyes. Harry Anderson, you are so good to me. I can't remember the last time I felt like this. We lay watching the video, and she giggled quietly every time I took notes. On every stage, I asked, Have you ever tried this? And she answered. If she said no, I asked, Do you want to try? If she said yes, I asked, do you like it? By the end, I had a list of her preferences and what she would like to try. I showed her my notes. She laughed again when she saw the list with comments about shots, angles, and positions. I'm lying in bed with you and watching a video, and instead of getting aroused, you analyze it. Well, you want me to do it right, don't you? I said. I told her my plan about bringing Alex home and giving Susan one happy day with him before I left. I knew my leaving would be a shock to her, but I couldn't handle the lie anymore. I didn't know if her cheating was still going on, and I think I was too scared to find out. Sarah listened and then began counting down the days, at which point she noted that since the kids would be home all weekend and Gary wouldn't leave until Tuesday morning, we wouldn't see each other for a week. Seven days is too long, Harry, she said. Up until this point, we hadn't even exchanged phone numbers. We did this before I left, with a promise to keep in touch. When I arrived at the hospital, my phone beeped with a new message. This was from Sarah. Seven days is too long. I'll think of something. See you soon. I smiled to myself and thought, yeah, I'm sure she'll come up with something. I was still smiling when I met Susan. That's what I like to see my man with a smile on his face. 
She wrapped her arms around my neck and leaned up to kiss me softly on the lips. She was in a great mood and told me that everything was fine and that we could take Alex home after dialysis the next day. She asked me not to be late for dinner by eight, kissed me again and left. It was great to see how good Alex looked and we chatted happily. He was still worried about his mother and it made me feel selfish because I was going to make things worse. However, I could not forget what I had learned and my relationship with Susan would never be the same. I still believed that breaking up would be better for everyone in the end. That evening went well. I said I needed to work and went to bed late. The next day I took Alex to the hospital and left Susan at home to prepare the house and get Maddie and Jacob from her mother. By mid-afternoon, Alex was released and I took him home, where he was greeted with thunderous applause. He was the center of attention, which was fine with me because I had a presentation the next day and needed to prepare. The presentation went well and I could expect to be paid for the project. This took me all day and in the evening I worked again until late at night. Friday was day X. I took Alex to dialysis by 10.30 a.m. and gave him my old phone, telling him it would help him fight boredom during long procedures. We got home mid-afternoon and Susan was thinking about what to make for dinner. What would you like for dinner, Harry? she asked. I'm not staying for dinner tonight, Susan. I'm leaving, I said. She stood with a puzzled expression on her face. What do you mean, where are you going? She asked, still not understanding. I'm leaving you, Susan. You will find a short explanation on my desk in my office, along with my house keys. I've already taken the things I need, and I hope you'll let me come back for the rest when I find a place to stay. I suggest taking turns taking Alex to dialysis. If it's convenient for you, I'd like to take the kids for a weekend in one week. I'll contact you. I said and headed for the door. Several seconds passed before my words reached her. She ran into the office to find the note. It looked more like a pictogram than a note. I made it using the same photographs that I found in the attic. It said, Susan plus Gary equals sign Alex, and underneath it the words, When were you going to tell me? I heard her scream as I walked out the door. As I pulled out of the driveway, she ran out of the house caught up with the car, and, with a tear-stained face, screamed out the window. Harry, don't do this. We need to talk. When I got onto the road, I rolled down the window and said, Susan, the time to talk was 14 years ago. Don't you think you're late? I left. I didn't realize then how quickly people start to take sides when a relationship breaks down. Everyone I knew loved Susan, including my own family. When I arrived at my brother's, his wife Wendy greeted me with accusations that I had not been completely honest with Bob and said that my mother had called to find out if they had me. Wendy answered her truthfully that I was not there at that time. We won't lie for you, Harry. You love Susan, and no matter what either of you did, you have an obligation to talk and try to work things out, she said. I asked if that meant I couldn't stay with them, and she softened a little. You're Bob's brother, and we love you, but we're not going to be hostages in this situation. I said that I would try to find a place to live next week and went into my room to work. That evening, I received a message. It was from Sarah and Reed. Seven days is too long. See you tomorrow for dinner at the Palmer restaurant at 1930. Be there. I replied, I'm looking forward to it. I also received several emails from Susan. The first one was, Harry, I love only you. Please come home and we can talk about everything. Then this. Harry, it's not what you think. Please call me. I responded to this letter with a short question. Can you guarantee that I am the father of our children? Her answer said it all. She wrote, Please, Harry, come home and talk to me about this, if not for my sake, then for the sake of the children. We all love you and want you back. My answer was short and clear. I understand that the answer is no. Now I'm adding you to the blacklist and all your future emails will be automatically deleted by the server. I also received several messages from Alex asking what was going on, but all I could do was tell him to talk to his mother and told him I would pick him up on Tuesday for dialysis.
The next day, I spent time looking for an apartment through real estate agencies. Finding something at a reasonable price was difficult. My income from the business was good by most people's standards, but paying for a second apartment would put a serious dent in my budget and leave little room for saving for my children's education. However, a pleasant evening lay ahead of me, and by 1930 I was already sitting in the bar of the Palmer restaurant, waiting for a meeting. It was perhaps the best restaurant in the city, and I felt a little out of place because I was dressed too simply. A linen jacket, trousers, and a shirt without a tie. Most of the men were in tuxedos or morning suits. Sarah added to my discomfort when she entered the hall wearing a floor-length evening dress with a short fur cape over her shoulders. When she went to the wardrobe and took off the cape, a lump formed in my throat, and I could hardly utter a word. She came up to me and greeted me, kissing me on both cheeks. Harry, darling, have you been waiting long? Only ten minutes, I lied. Would you like an aperitif? We settled on Kerr, and I ordered it while she talked to the head waiter, with whom she was on friendly terms. The table will be ready in ten minutes, she said, sitting down next to me. She said that her mother stayed at her home, caring for the children, although they were too old to be called nannies. So, Harry, was it really that bad? I explained to her what happened yesterday, and while I was doing this, we were invited to a table. As soon as we sat down, I continued this whole sad story, including emails. How are you feeling now, Harry? I told her I wasn't proud of myself. I felt that I had hurt Susan greatly, but I couldn't imagine how I could leave without hurting her. However, I still felt like a creep. But it hurts you too, Harry, I understand that. I told her that Wendy didn't want me to stay, and how my mother had tried to contact me to convince me to come back, and how I felt somewhat isolated. I said that I knew that if I told the family the real reasons for leaving, everything would be turned upside down, and the family would not give Susan any chance, and even worse, my mother would probably want to end all relations with my children. I didn't want this. What if someone tells the children? No, I'd rather remain a villain. I knew I still loved her, but I couldn't trust her. We were interrupted from time to time to take orders or bring food and wine. Sometimes she would reach out and squeeze mine. I felt relieved after pouring my heart out to her. As we ordered dessert, I looked up and noticed that she was looking at me quite intently. I asked what was wrong. She answered with a question. How old are you, Harry? Forty-four, forty-five? Thirty-nine, I said indignantly. I bet you've had this hairstyle since high school, and it's time for you to change your glasses, too. You will become my project, Harry. I will turn you into a sexy 35-year-old. How are you? I said. She laughed. Yes, like me. She continued to tell me how she was going to change my image until the brandy arrived. What's your most pressing problem, Harry? A place to live. Yes, this is my most pressing problem. And it has to be inexpensive. A place where you can work and where you can bring your kids, right? Yes, I agreed. When she took out the phone, the waiter came up and said that she couldn't use the phone in the restaurant, she would have to go to the bar. She left for a while, then returned with a smile. A four-room house, not far from the city, you pay all the utilities, your house tax, keep the house and garden in order, and if Charlotte approves, you can live there for six months. You will look after the house. We're going to Charlotte's on Monday at 10. Oh, I almost forgot to mention, Gary is leaving for Turkey a day early, so we can meet on Monday. I called the waiter and asked for the bill. He said that everything has already been paid. Sarah giggled. Daddy's generosity, but he doesn't know about it. I smiled and took her coat out of the wardrobe. What now, Harry? I assumed that she needed to return, but it turns out that Mom will stay with her all night. I hope you're not planning on going home, not after that wine and brandy. No, I was ready for this. I booked a room at the Travelodge around the corner. Do you have a number, Harry? Then what are we waiting for? In my hotel room, she called a taxi around 1.30 a.m. and left me to recover. In the morning, I returned to Bob's house. I told Wendy I would be leaving soon, and she was clearly embarrassed, but I understood. 
In the spare room, it was time to get some work done, so I pulled out my laptop and started. Concentrating on work was difficult with everything going on in my head. Soon I received a letter from Alex. On dialysis board, I want to talk to you, Dad. I replied, Is Mom there? He quickly replied, No. She's with Maddie and Jacob, you know. I closed my laptop and went to the hospital. As soon as I got there, I realized that I had been fooling myself into thinking I could get through it with as little pain as possible. In any breakup, everyone suffers, and Alex reminded me of this forcefully. He was aggressive from the start. Why did you leave us, Dad? He knew where to hit. I tried to explain that I had not abandoned them, only their mother, and that once I found a place to live, they would always be welcome. But why can't you live with us? This is what we all want, even Mom. Now, son, I cannot live in the same house with your mother. I can't tell you why, it would be wrong. Your mother should tell you this. I tried to remain calm, but I saw that he did not understand. Mom can't explain anything to us. She just cries. She said it was her fault that she did something unforgivable. Obviously, Susan didn't want them to hate me, I thought, but I can't tell him what happened without ruining him. What a damn mess. Alex started putting pressure on me again. What did Mom do that was so unforgivable? You always told us that everyone deserves a second chance. Doesn't this concern Mom? Direct hit. I burst into tears. I'm sorry, Alex, I said, choking on tears. I can't talk about it now, and until I can, I can't talk to your mother. Sorry, son, I got up and left. I was able to make some progress on the new project, but progress was slow. The images kept popping into my head as I tried to concentrate. Gary and Susan are laughing together, laughing at me, I thought. Alex, teetering on the brink of death. Gary raising his hand to Susan and me knocking Gary's teeth out. I don't remember when I fell asleep, but I woke up the next day, fully clothed, just lying on top of the bed. The knot in my stomach reminded me that I hadn't eaten the day before. I texted Sarah, can I buy you breakfast? And went to the bathroom to take a shower. When I returned, a message from Sarah was already waiting for me. Come to me, I'll feed you breakfast. I admit, the smiley face at the end alarmed me a little. I wasn't sure I needed more sex right now. Despite this, I got into the car and was soon on my way. When I arrived at Sarah's place, to my surprise, she was fully dressed. Jeans, a t-shirt, high-heeled sandals, her hair in a ponytail. Then I remembered that we were going to meet Charlotte today. She sat me down at the kitchen table, gave me a glass of orange juice, and told me that I would have to wait a few minutes until the eggs were ready. Soon she served me a breakfast better than any I could have bought anywhere. I bet you haven't been eating well lately. We can't let this happen, Harry. You need to gain strength. We went to look at the house. Charlotte turned out to be a nice girl, a little bit wide in the hips, with small breasts, short mousy red hair, and a pretty face. I could easily imagine her riding a horse. She conducted a sort of interview, asking me about my background, what I do, if I have any pets, and so on. In the end, it turned out that I, as a single professional, met most of the requirements and, thanks to Sarah's recommendation, I did not need any recommendations. Charlotte said that the house belongs to a family whose head works in the diplomatic service, and they were transferred abroad and took the whole family with them. The house was fully furnished, and I had to, to ensure that it remains in the same condition as when they left. The owners will leave for at least six months. If longer, they will decide on the future fate of the house. I had to pay all utilities and replace any damaged items. Charlotte had some money for occasional repairs and maintenance that couldn't be charged to me. Pets were not allowed in the house, to which Sarah made a sad face. The house turned out to be very pleasant, on a wooded plot on the outskirts of the city. Four bedrooms, two of which are en suite, and a double garage. In the garage there were a Jeep Cherokee and a Porsche Boxster, which I was strictly forbidden to touch. After that, Charlotte handed me the keys, hugged Sarah and kissed her on both cheeks, as is customary, and left. Do you like it? asked Sarah. Like, this is like luxury living for me. How do you even know these people?
Oh, I don't know the owners, but Charlotte is an old school friend of mine, and she's been tasked with finding someone to look after the house. Just because my dad forced me to marry a truck driver doesn't mean I have to live in his world. You would fit perfectly into my world, Harry. It would be good for your business. After I dropped Sarah home, I went back to Bob's house to start packing for the move. While I was loading the car, Wendy returned from dropping the kids off at school and looked at me a little confused. Harry, there was really no need to rush so much. I didn't want to kick you out. I know, Wendy. I just didn't think about how this would affect those around me. I don't want you to have to lie because of me, because lying is what got me into this situation. What happened, Harry? She asked, as I expected. Better ask Susan about it. I don't want to say anything that she doesn't want you to know. This became my standard answer. You seem to still love her, Harry. Is it really impossible to return everything to normal? Of course I still love her. This is what complicates everything. If I hated her, it would be easy. I could tell everyone what I wanted and not worry if it hurt her. And everything that hurts her hurts me too. If our marriage was a car, I could fix it. Remove the faulty part and replace it with a new one. But that doesn't happen in relationships. Change even one little thing and everything collapses. Where are you going? She asked. It's better for you not to know, so if mom or Susan calls, you won't have to lie. It's somewhere nearby, so we'll see each other anyway. Thanks for having me, Wendy. No offense, Harry, she said, brushing a tear from her cheek. No offense, Wendy, I replied and hugged her before getting in the car and driving away. The new house had a small office with a telephone and internet connection. By the end of that evening, I had everything sorted out and ready to start working again. It was only when I began to think about going to bed that I realized that I was hungry and that I had not eaten since breakfast. Of course, there was nothing in the cupboards, so I had to put it off until tomorrow. The next day at 10 in the morning, I arrived at my own house to pick up Alex for dialysis. I rang the doorbell and Susan answered it. She looked worse than I felt. Her eyes were bloodshot, there was no trace of makeup, she was wearing sweatpants and a sweatshirt. I was terribly afraid of this meeting, but Susan held on. She greeted me with a smile. Harry, you don't need to knock on your own door. Take the keys back, she asked and sent Alex to get my keys. When she handed them to me, I thanked her. Okay, I'll take them for a while. I found a place to stay and will need to go back for some things. I was thinking maybe Thursday when you take Alex to dialysis. Her face darkened at the mention of my finding a place to live. As she lowered the keys into my hand, she held it with both of hers. We need to talk, Harry. Nothing is as it seems. So you haven't been deceiving me all these years? Because that's what it looks like. She let go of my hand and ran into the living room, crying. Well done, Dad, Alex said, coming out to me. Do you know how long she prepared for this, rehearsed what to say? Maybe you're right and you shouldn't come back just yet. I drove him to the hospital in silence, stayed with him in the dialysis room, and watched as they connected the equipment. As the machine began to cleanse his blood, he looked at me. Dad, if I ask you a direct question, will you answer honestly? If there is an honest answer, then yes, I will, I said. Does everything that happens between you and Mom have something to do with my accident? Because before him you seemed so happy, and everything went wrong when I was in the hospital. The straight answer is no. The only connection is that while you were in the hospital, I learned things I didn't know before. But it would still come out sooner or later. Neither you nor other children are to blame for this. We, the so-called adults, ruined everything. He said I could leave and I left, promising to be back by 2.30 p.m. to pick him up. I needed to buy food and see Sarah. At 2.30 p.m. I picked up Alex and took him home. I said I wouldn't come in this time. Before he got out of the car, he put his hand on my shoulder. Dad, when you come to pick up your things, don't leave the keys. Why? Your mother probably doesn't want me to be able to come and go as I please. Because as long as you have the keys, Mom can trust that you will come back, he said. You'll come back one day, right? 
When did he become so smart? I watched him until the door closed behind him. I returned to my house, determined to get to work. The feeling of hunger reminded me that I hadn't eaten all day again, but somehow that didn't seem to matter. When I realized that I was hungry, I was already too lazy to cook. Sarah and I's relationship extended beyond the bedroom, and she became a frequent visitor to my home. If it weren't for her and the children who came to see me every weekend, I probably would have lost weight completely. I couldn't sleep more than four hours a night, so I worked into the early morning hours. At first this didn't bother me as it kept me ahead of all projects, but over time the weight loss became noticeable. Sarah noticed this first because she saw me more often than others and began asking questions about my diet and sleep. I wasn't worried because I could afford to lose some weight, but Sarah saw a deeper problem. She signed me up for the same gym that she went to herself and took care of my physical condition. I've never liked going to the gym, but it was much more enjoyable with a partner, especially because it gave me the opportunity to see Sarah in gym shorts. We bought a couple of bikes and often went out into the local forests and parks to ride the trails. Gradually my appetite returned and I became so tired that I only woke up with an alarm clock in the morning. I am leaner and fitter than I was before. Sarah was delighted and wanted to start rebooting my image, but I reminded her that we had not finished the film yet. We couldn't allow one of the main characters to change his appearance in the middle of filming. We still had to film the sex scenes. It was during one of these sessions that I finally lost all enthusiasm for the film. Gary handled the French roads very well and arrived in Calais two hours earlier than planned. Instead of hanging around waiting for the ferry, he decided to try his luck and caught an earlier flight. It so happened that Sarah and I were still in bed when he returned home. He must have heard us. When he opened the bedroom door and saw us, his jaw dropped. What the hell is going on here? Sarah turned around and looked at him. What does it look like? Now, if you don't mind, we'd like some privacy. In those few seconds that he stood in the doorway, I saw his face change from indignation to rage, and then into suppressed resignation. His manhood withered and died before my eyes. I couldn't get the image of Gary out of my head, and in that moment I knew I didn't want to humiliate him anymore. Once filming was completed, Sarah began her project to transform Harry Anderson. The first thing that changed was my hairstyle. The one I had since school gave way to something more stylish. I left the hair salon with much less hair and was given instructions on how to maintain the new look between appointments. Then it was time for the glasses. She took me to an optician and made me try almost every frame in the store. Then she called the saleswoman, put on me the ones she liked best, and asked the girl which ones best emphasized my facial features. Between them, they chose a couple. Honestly, said the saleswoman, it seems to me that he's better off without glasses. So I started wearing contact lenses. The next step was to modernize my wardrobe. She sorted through my clothes, dividing them into three piles, to donate, to throw away, and to keep. The keep pile was the smallest of the three. With Sarah as my style advisor, I ordered a couple of tailored suits, and then we went shopping for more casual clothes. It was difficult, but I managed to persuade her to limit herself to regular shops on the main street. The transformation was almost complete when, during one of our shopping trips, I almost ran into my sister-in-law Wendy. Hi, Wendy, I said. She stopped and turned to me. Harry, she asked, as if not believing her eyes. Sorry, I didn't recognize you. You look so different. We chatted a bit, and I introduced Sarah to her as an old friend. Not that old, Sarah said, and we all laughed. I promised Wendy that I would bring the kids to visit soon. By then, almost two months had passed since I left Susan. I saw the kids every weekend, but Susan and I still didn't discuss our relationship because we only dated in front of the kids and neither of us wanted to talk about it in front of them. And then I made another big mistake. The children really liked the house in which I now lived. They liked the large garden. They liked that the house was close to parks and forests. And I still don't understand why I managed to introduce them to Sarah. I agreed that she would come to visit us one Saturday. 
When she arrived, I introduced her as an old friend and explained that it was she who helped me find this wonderful house. Jacob and Maddie were kind to her, but Alex seemed rather hostile. The following Thursday, when I went to pick him up for dialysis, he didn't come out. I waited a little, then went up and rang the doorbell. Susan opened it with a guilty look. Sorry, Harry, I didn't have a chance to contact you. Alex arranged for patient transport to pick him up from the hospital, and he left around nine in the morning. It wasn't me, Harry. He arranged everything himself, she continued, her eyes full of tears. I hugged her shoulders. Susan, one thing I know for sure is that you would never do anything to hurt me on purpose. So this is the beginning, Harry, isn't it? Yes, this is the beginning, I agreed and left again. Alex no longer came to my house and soon completely broke off all contacts. I can't say it didn't hurt me, and after a few weeks I found myself starting my day by parking near my house to watch the patient transport arrive to pick it up. It only took a few minutes a week, but it allowed me to see him and Susan and make sure they were okay. Sarah consoled me, assuring me that Alex would definitely change his mind. She just didn't know Alex. I knew that I had lost my eldest son, and I understood that as he grew older, others would follow. I felt like I had nothing to lose, so I went to a lawyer to file for divorce due to irreconcilable differences. Soon after, Sarah's children left on a 10-day school trip. I was looking forward to these days when she didn't have to go home in the middle of the day, but it actually wasn't what I expected. On the first evening, she suggested we go out for dinner and I took her to a nice village pub we had recently found. She said she wanted to talk, and I prepared myself for the possibility that she was going to leave me. You know that phrase, it was fun, but now it's time to move on. But I was not ready for what happened. We made it to dessert before she said anything beyond small talk, and then she said the main thing. I've never said this to any man before, but I'm in love with you, Harry Anderson. I tried to interject something, but she stopped me. No, Harry, don't interrupt. I need to say this. I love you, Harry, and I think we can be happy together. I can live with the fact that you will always put Susan first. I know you still love her and probably always will. But what I can't accept is that you're not as happy as you could be. You are a good person, Harry, and you deserve to be happy. But I'm happy. No, Harry, you are not happy. If you were happy, you wouldn't start your day sitting in the car waiting to catch a glimpse of your son. Lately, when we are alone, your thoughts go somewhere. Where are you going, Harry? She didn't expect an answer to this question. If I stay with you, Harry, it must be on the terms that you never return to Susan. Like I said, I can accept that you love her, even though you may love her more than you love me, but I have to be sure that you can't get over what happened between you. Well, I already filed for divorce. Is this not enough? No, Harry, that's not enough. You never talked to her about it. We both know that Susan isn't the type to jump into Gary's bed for a quick fling, and the idea that she had an affair with him for four years is absurd. You said to yourself that you don't know how often or if this is still going on. The only way to find out is to talk to her. I was overwhelmed. There was so much to process. We drove home almost in silence. I was hoping she would stay the night, but Sarah said I needed to think seriously about it. One thing I knew for sure, when women are right, they are right. I've been a stubborn fool and it's time to make things right. The next morning I went to see Susan. I even bought flowers along the way. I didn't think too much, I just walked up to the door and rang the bell. Nobody answered. I walked around the house, hoping that she was in the garden but there was no one there either. Returning to the exit, I noticed that her car was not there. I was about to leave when Mrs. Mason, who lived across the street, came to the house. How can I help? Oh, I wanted to see Susan. I'll try to come by later. Well, maybe you'll get lucky, maybe you won't. Her son is feeling bad again, you know. They didn't return from the hospital last night. I thanked her and handed her the flowers, got into the car and drove straight to the hospital. I saw Susan's car in the parking lot. At the dialysis department, I found them in a separate room. Through the glass I saw Alex, half-conscious on the bed, and Susan sitting next to him, holding his hand. 
I decided not to bother them and went to look for a doctor to find out what was going on. I eventually found the same doctor who treated Alex the first time. He explained that Alex had been having problems since starting dialysis and was diagnosed with a collapsed vein. This in itself was not critical, but excluded further dialysis. He added that Alex is now on the priority list for a kidney transplant, and it is a matter of time until a suitable organ is found. Time during which my son will weaken and possibly die. Come on, Mr. Anderson, it's too early to think about such things. Take one of my kidneys. I have a spare one. Give it to Alex. Mr. Anderson, in order to use a living donor, we need a near-perfect tissue match to reduce the risk of rejection. If we transplant your kidney into Alex and he rejects it, we gain nothing and put you at great risk. The probability that there will be a suitable match for a relative is extremely small. You have a better chance of winning the lottery. That's why we didn't test you last time. He was about to leave when I grabbed him by the collar of his robe. It's my son dying there. Do this damn test for me, I shouted. I suddenly realized what I had done, let him go, and stepped back. Mr. Anderson, I understand that you are desperate. That's why I won't call security, but you have to understand that this won't help anyone. He began to turn around. This time I didn't grab him or scream. I just said, Doc, do you have kids? Yes, son and daughter. If any of them were in the same situation as Alex, how could you live with yourself if you thought you didn't do everything you could to save them? He called the nurse. Nurse, take Mr. Anderson for a tissue test. The papers should already be waiting for you there. Tell them this is a priority. Make sure all contact details are recorded correctly. Then he added, Don't forget, Mr. Anderson, the probability is the same as winning the lottery. I returned home around two o'clock in the afternoon and found Sarah waiting for me. She kissed me and we entered the house. You look bad, Harry. What's happened? Have you spoken to Susan? I told her about my morning and she hugged me. I apologized for not talking to Susan, saying that I thought she had enough on her plate as it was. Sarah agreed and got up to make us lunch. I had no appetite, but I sat down at the table just to enjoy her company. We were talking over dinner, and she asked me what I remembered about our conversation in the pub the night before. I remember you said you loved me. Moreover, you said that you are in love with me. It took me a long time to understand this. You see, this has never happened to me. Imagine Harry, a 35-year-old woman who has never fallen in love. I never said I love you, right? It was wrong of me because I really love you. The problem is that you were right. I also love Susan, but being husband and wife requires more than just love. It also requires trust, and I'm not sure I'll ever be able to trust Susan again. As soon as Alex is out of danger, I'll talk to her. That day we took our bikes and rode into the forest and spent several hours exploring the paths. When we got home, we made love, and then I cooked us dinner. I was about to pour us a second glass of wine, but stopped. It's better not, Cinderella must return home before her carriage turns into a pumpkin. Can I stay the night, Harry? Just once, and even if it's just once, I'd like to know what it's like to wake up in the arms of the man I love. I poured some wine. I didn't count how many times we made love that night. It seemed to happen every time one of us woke up. I can only say that I was in seventh heaven, although there was very little alcohol in my blood. When I woke up alone, I started to think it was all a dream until I heard singing coming from downstairs. I put on my robe and went down to the kitchen. There, wearing only an apron and holding a frying pan in her hand, stood the angel with whom I shared the bed. Well, hello, lover she said with a smile. I was just about to start cooking eggs and bacon. Get yourself some coffee. I poured us both coffee and just stood there, admiring every curve of her body, when I was suddenly brought back to reality by a phone call. Still lost in her beauty, I walked over and picked up the phone. Hello, this is Harry Anderson. Hello, Mr. Anderson. This is the nephrology department of Browncaston Hospital. We would like you to come discuss the results of your tissue test. Yes, of course, I replied. I'm just going to have breakfast, so I'll be there in an hour. 
We'd rather you skip breakfast, Mr. Anderson, said the voice on the other end of the line. Okay, then I'll be there in half an hour. Sorry, honey, I called Sarah. The hospital wants me to be on an empty stomach. Then you should go, she said, and Harry, I'll be here when you wake up. Sarah kept her word and stayed with me until late at night. The nurses seemed to be paying more attention to me than I should have. I got the impression that they thought living donors were something special. The day after the surgery, she brought my laptop as I asked. She kept me busy, so I spent time editing the video we made together. Sometimes I showed her certain frames and we laughed. The next day it was already 10.30 and no one came to see me. I finished the video and burned it to DVD. One of the nurses secretly brought me an envelope and I put the disc in there, signed it and asked her to mail it. Half an hour later the door opened and I heard a voice. Harry Anderson, you are a stubborn, willful, stubborn, wonderful, wonderful person. Susan ran into the room, hugged me and kissed me. After the kiss, she continued to hug me so tightly that I had to say it hurt. How is he? He's in great shape, everything is working, and he's looking better every minute. Wait until I tell him that he now has his father's kidney. I'd rather you didn't tell him, I said. I don't want him to feel like he owes me anything. That's why I ask not to tell you. How did you know it was me? Then she, with tears in her eyes, confessed to me. I didn't know at first, she said. I thought Gary had changed his mind. So I asked where I could find him, and the reception staff said he didn't show up here. I didn't know how long people were kept after surgery, so I thought maybe he had already been sent home. I found the number and called his house. When I spoke to his wife, she laughed and said that he was in Turkey and would not be back for three more days. I was completely confused, Harry, and started saying some nonsense, and suddenly she asked me if I was Susan. When I said yes, she replied, And you think my selfish little rascal of a husband donated his kidney to your son? Well, I have to tell you, Gary would never do that, but Harry would. I called the hospital again, told you your name, and they told me where to find you. Oh, Harry, I missed you so much, she said. I hugged her while she cried. As she began to come to her senses, she pulled away and wiped her tears with a handkerchief. And now that the children are not around, you won't be able to escape. You and I need to talk. I told her I was going to do this as soon as I found out Alex was back in the hospital and agreed that we really needed to talk things out. Okay, let's start with this. She took an envelope from her bag, took out a letter, and read it aloud. It was a divorce notice, based on irreconcilable differences. I think I provoked it myself. I half expected the lawsuit to allege infidelity, because that's what you suspect me of, right? Well, I guess so. But you have to understand that I would never do this to you. Harry, I am a stupid woman who cheated and lied to you. My last lie almost cost us our son, but I never cheated on you. You are the only man who has ever been in my bed and the only one I wanted there. So, our three children are the fruits of the Immaculate Conception. Why didn't the angel Gabriel come to tell me about this? She started crying again. Through her tears, she began to get angry and shout. Do you want to know who made me children? I'll show you who did it. She rummaged in her bag and pulled out a plastic tube with a rubber bulb on the end. Here, she screamed, Mr. Turkey did it. A nurse appeared at the door. I showed her that everything was okay. I apologized and said that I would try not to interrupt while Susan told her story. Why don't you start from the beginning? Okay, Harry, I'm sorry I lost my temper. Like you said, I'll start from the beginning. Do you remember how it was? I desperately wanted a child, I recorded temperature charts, calculated the most fertile days, and your friends kept joking that we had been married for three years and still had no children. Gary was the worst. He constantly talked about how he succeeded the first time he touched his girlfriend. Then we started taking tests and my results were fine, but yours showed very low odds. The doctor said it wasn't impossible, but it would take more than just luck. Oh, Harry, when I saw your face, I realized how much it hurt you. So you want to say that you did it for me? Of course not, Harry. Let me continue. Every snide comment they made was a blow to you, 
and I was afraid that I was becoming too old for children. Now it seems funny, because 40-year-old women give birth to their first children, but then I was very worried. Somehow Gary must have sensed the tension between us and started coming to visit when he knew you wouldn't be there. Usually this was due to the fact that he needed to take something from you or borrow a tool. He lingered, talked, and always brought up the topic of our lack of children. He always implied that it was your fault. He said, Old Harry still can't, and other similar things. He repeated, Susan, if you want a child, you need a real man. Come to me. Ha, a real man. Too cowardly to even take a tissue test. Anyway, Harry, one day he came again, and it was just before the most fertile period. You know how nervous I was on days like these. I was then reading an article about a girl who got pregnant with Turkey Baster, using the liquid with her boyfriend's DNA. When he started talking about the same thing again, I asked him directly, Are you suggesting that I get pregnant from you? He replied, Yes, if you allow it. And then I said, Okay, deal with me, and went upstairs to change clothes. He probably thought he was lucky when I came down in the black lace lingerie you loved. But everything was not as he planned. I stimulated him to get what I needed, but I never had sex with him. And then she said, Thank you, you can go. He wasn't happy, Harry. He started threatening to tell everyone that he slept with me. I replied that if anything comes out, I will say that he did it without my consent, and you will kill him. I also said that if I get pregnant, he will pay child support. This stopped him, he flew out the door. I kept his sample in the refrigerator, and on the most fertile day, when we were making love as usual and you fell asleep, I went to the bathroom and used a turkey bastard to inject Gary's sample. When I got pregnant, I didn't know what to do, but you seemed so happy, and there was a chance the baby was yours, Harry. I think I wanted him to be yours so badly that I convinced myself of it. When Alex had his accident and they started talking about blood transplants, I realized that if neither of us were a match, you might start asking questions. So I made up a story about a previous marriage so they wouldn't test you. I'm sorry, Harry, I wanted him to be your son, but when push came to shove, I knew the odds were stacked against us. I went to Gary to ask him to take the test, but he refused. Tears began to flow again. I got on my knees and begged him, Harry, begged him to help us. I know, I saw you. She buried herself in the bed and cried. I reached out my hand, stroked her head, and waited for her to calm down. She raised her head and looked at me. Let's say I believe you, I said. That explains Alexa, but what about Maddie and Jacob? Even Gary isn't stupid enough to do it twice, let alone a third time. I paid him a hundred pounds at a time, or if you like, a hundred pounds per child. The bastard insisted that I wear sexy lingerie again to turn him on, as he said but now I have two beautiful children. She looked into my eyes. I always gave you a head start, Harry. I really wanted them to be yours. They say that a woman looks for lies in her eyes and a man listens to them in his voice. My ears told me that this ridiculous story was true. Well, who would invent such a thing? He's undergoing a procedure now, you know. Yes, I know. He called me before the operation and asked if I wanted another child before he turned off the taps. He wanted 500 pounds for it. I told him that we already have a fairly large family. I was in a state of shock and didn't know what to do. If all this was true, and I believed it was, then I was the one who broke our marriage vows, and now I would have to make a choice, either way, someone I loved would be hurt. Well, that's the whole story. I know that what I did was wrong and that it hurt you greatly. I love you, Harry, and if you can forgive me and come back to us, it will make me and our children very happy. We missed you, and I, of course, missed you in bed. I know I brought this all on myself, and if you don't want to come home, I understand. I just sat there holding my head, feeling enormous pressure, as if my skull was being squeezed from all sides. Finally, I lowered my hands and looked at her. Tears ruined her makeup, she looked so vulnerable and helpless. I didn't know where to start. Susan, I said, I'm probably the only man in the world who would believe this story, and it's only because I know you so well that I really believe it. 
but what I still can't understand is why you did this to Gary. We had already discussed the option of artificial insemination, and you knew that I was not against it. I would give my right hand to give you a child. I know, Harry, but at that time everything was already done. I almost told you then, but you said that the donor had to be someone we didn't know because you couldn't live with the idea that someone you knew might come and lay claim to our child. My God, what a mess, was all I could say. The first thing I have to tell you, Harry, is that although I didn't cheat on you, I know that you cheated on me. Is this with your old friend Sarah? She asked with emphasis on the word friend. Wendy said she was no more than 25. Yes, it's with Sarah. She's 35 and Gary's wife. I pushed you into this myself, Harry. You would never have done this if I hadn't lied to you. Nevertheless, I did it, and now the situation has become much more complicated. More people are involved. Is she really as beautiful as Wendy says? Well, I don't know what Wendy told you, but yes, she is really very beautiful. And you love her, Harry? Yes, I love you, I said, not daring to look into her eyes, so as not to see her pain. Does she love you? Yes, she loves. I think she was about to offer to move in with me when the hospital called. I told her the whole story about how I actually intended to kill Gary by beating him to death with my bare hands. I told her about the house, about my depression, and how Sarah pulled me out of it by getting me to exercise and ride a bike. I even told her about the video we made for Gary. Oh, Harry, how do you do it? What exactly? Here's a woman who's trying to steal my husband, and I should want to claw her eyes out, but by the time you finish talking, she seems so sweet that I want to thank her for taking care of you. She's not trying to steal your husband. She knows that I still love you and probably always will. She told me that I should come to you and talk to see if there is a chance that we can get back together. Perhaps that is why she is not here now. But you said she wanted to move in with you. Susan said, bewildered. I think it's more about the fact that if I'm still free when everything calms down, she won't miss me. Are you still free, Harry? I don't know, Susan, I really don't know, I said apologetically. Well, she said, tapping the divorce notice, you better decide quickly. These people charge money for every minute. As she approached the door, she looked back at me. Harry, do you know what the chances are that a non-blood relative would be a near-perfect donor? More chances to win the lottery. We can do a paternity test. No, he is my son. I changed his diapers. I helped you feed him. I'm the one who taught him to ride a bike. Does it matter who won the race? He is my son, and no test in the world will change that. She smiled at me and closed the door. That day, they removed the drain from the wound, so I got up, got dressed, left a note for Sarah, and went to find Alex. I found him and Susan still in the same room where I saw them before. Alex sat, looking more cheerful than he had in months. When I entered, his face darkened, and he looked at his mother. She looked at me with a wide smile. How are you feeling, Harry? She asked. I'm fine, I replied, and then turned to Alex. How are you, young man? I think it's okay, he said. They found a donor for me, and two days ago I received a kidney transplant. I came closer and shook his hand. I expected him to pull it away, but he didn't. I'm sorry I haven't visited you for so long, I said. I injured my back and couldn't get out of bed for several days. Susan smiled at me again, crossed the bed, took my hand and squeezed it. What is this anyway? Alex asked. Have you and your mother made up already? Not really said his mother. But we talked and figured out a lot of things. Yes, I added, laughing. She caught me at a time when I couldn't escape. My ears are still ringing. Alex grinned. Don't joke, Dad, it hurts to laugh. We just established communication, I said. Do you have your phone with you? Susan handed me his phone from the nightstand, and I dialed my new number on it. This is my new mobile number, I said. Share it with your mom, brother, and sister. You can call me on it or on the old work number. Susan looked at me in surprise. So all this time I just had to call your office to find you. Of course, I answered. I was still working, you know. 
Susan and Alex started laughing, but Alex immediately felt pain in his stitches. I spent some more time with them, telling Alex that he would need to be more careful in the future and reminding him that he would still have to take anti-rejection medication. Don't worry, Dad, he said. I know this is my second chance. Everyone deserves a second chance, right? Yes, I replied, pretending that I didn't get the hint. But rarely does anyone get the third one. As I turned to leave, Susan stood up and walked to the door. She took my hand and said, Thank you, Harry. Then, to my surprise, she stood on her tiptoes, kissed me on the cheek, and whispered in my ear, I love you. I put my other hand on hers and said, One step at a time, Susan. One step at a time. When I returned to the room, I saw Sarah waiting for me at the nurse's station. She grabbed my hand and took me back to my room. Let's go, she said. You are a patient, not a visitor. As soon as we returned to the room, she asked, How is he, Harry? I told her how good Alex looked and that we were having a pretty normal conversation. Did Susan come to see you? She asked. Yes, I came, I answered. And who told her that I was here? Hem, probably me, she admitted. Sorry, Harry, I just couldn't let Gary get all the credit for Alex's recovery. Sarah told me that the nurses planned to discharge me the next day and that she would come pick me up. The next day I was actually discharged with the condition that someone would look after me at home. I lied and said it would happen. I called Sarah and asked her to stay a little longer so I could visit Alex again. He looked great and apparently I made it before Susan arrived. He beat around the bush for a while and then asked the question that was bothering him. You and your mother got along well yesterday, so you'll be coming home soon. It's too early to tell, I replied. There are a lot of grievances that need to be overcome. But at least we started talking, and that's something, right? Yes, probably, he said. In any case, I will still come to you, and you can always come to my house. Will she be there? he asked. If you're talking about Sarah, then yes, maybe she'll be there sometimes, I replied. In that case, I'd better not come, he said. Listen, Alex, I said, not hiding my irritation, Sarah is not the reason I left your mother. No, he answered, but she might be the reason why you don't come back. I changed the subject and started asking him what he was doing now that he was feeling better. We discussed how he would catch up with the school curriculum. Just as I was about to leave, Susan arrived. Don't leave for me, Harry, she said. I didn't mean to, I replied. They have to pick me up, and I don't want to keep the person waiting. She decided to go out with me. We talked about how I was feeling, Jacob and Maddie. She guessed who would come for me, and when we approached the exit, we saw Sarah through the glass doors. Is this really the same little gray mouse that was Sarah? She said. I laughed. Sorry, but no. You're wrong. Do you want to go out and meet her? Well, Harry, I don't think that's the best idea, do you? I left her at the exit and went to meet Sarah. Hi, Harry she said before kissing me. I borrowed this, she pointed to the black Audi SUV. I thought it would be easier for you to get in and out in your condition. Over the next week, she looked after me as much as she could. My only disappointment was that she didn't want to risk making love until my stitches were removed. This happened 12 days after the operation. I came for an appointment at the hospital. At the reception, the girl said that the delay was about an hour and asked me to wait. Sarah and I sat next to each other, waiting our turn. After some time, a pretty nurse entered the waiting room and took the patient's history. Sarah stood up and walked towards her. I saw her nod in my direction, and the nurse covered her mouth with her hand to suppress a giggle. Sarah returned and sat down next to him. Not long left, she said. The nurse returned to the waiting room. Mr. Anderson, she called. I followed her into the office, where she asked me to lift my shirt and lie on my stomach. While she was removing the stitches, I asked, Do you know Sarah? Who? She asked again, and then, understanding, added, Oh, are you talking about the woman you came with? No, I haven't seen her before. Then what did she tell you that was so funny? No, nothing special, said the nurse, laughing. 
She simply said that you were a kidney donor and that you had not made love to her since your operation 12 days ago. Then she added that she was so hot that if we didn't hurry up, she would have to do it with you right in the waiting room. We both laughed, and then the nurse went back to work. She was very professional, and soon I was free. As I walked through the reception area, I took Sarah's hand. Let's go, I said. We have business to settle. We hurried to the car and headed home. We skipped lunch that day, and it wasn't until mid-afternoon that I asked if she was going to pick up the kids from school. Mom will pick it up, she said. I'm with you until six in the evening. Well, I said, pulling her in for a kiss, then we better make the most of this time. We were infatuated with each other when the phone rang. I picked up the phone. Hello, this is Harry Anderson. I can't believe all I had to do was do this to find you. Hi, Susan, I said. How can I help? Alex is coming home tomorrow, she said. We'll throw a party to celebrate his return. This is wonderful. NNN. Wonderful, I said. Are you hurt, Harry? No, I replied. Just a little and awkward, I said. I hope it's not too awkward, she said. I was hoping you would come. Oh, I think it's very likely, I said. Are you sure you're okay? She asked. I can come if you need help. No, I can handle it. I squeezed out. What time do you want me to arrive? Come at four if you can, said Susan. I think it might be earlier. Whatever you say, Harry. See you tomorrow. Bye. I said goodbye and hung up. You, I said, are a very naughty girl. Are you going to punish me, sir? She asked, a smile spreading across her face. We spent the rest of the day playing with pain and pleasure, walking the fine line between the two until she left me for the day. When I arrived at the party, I immediately realized that I should not have come. My mom was there, as well as Susan's mom and her stepdad, and my brother Bob and his wife Wendy. In short, all those people who wanted me to come home or knew the reason why I didn't. Susan was delighted with my arrival and greeted me with a kiss on the lips. She was followed by Jacob and Maddie, who ran up and hugged me. Even Alex came out to greet me. There were friends, neighbors, and friends of the children. Susan really did her best. She prepared, as usual, plenty of food. She even bought a case of my favorite beer. Susan brought me a beer, and I tried to surround myself with people who weren't my family. Are you going to avoid your mother all evening? Finally, my mother was able to catch me. I'm sorry, Mom. I know I've been neglecting you for the last six months or so. The thing is, it wasn't you that I was trying to avoid, but the lecture that I think I'm about to hear. If you think I'm going to tell you to stop acting like a spoiled child, you're right, she said. My mother thought Susan was the best thing that ever happened to me, and for 17 years I would agree with her. I couldn't tell her why I had doubts now. If she knew the whole story, she would demand paternity tests, and if they showed that the children were not mine, she would turn away from them. The children would never understand why Grandma didn't want to see them anymore. What does this new woman have that makes you leave your wife and children? She asked. This new woman, as you call her, was a result of my problems with Susan, not the cause of them. If it weren't for her, you might now be talking to me through prison bars. If you want to blame someone, blame me or Susan, but leave Sarah alone. Unfortunately, Mom, you're doing what you always do making judgments without knowing the whole story. What should I do if no one tells me anything? You don't tell me anything, and all Susan says is that it's all her fault. Maybe no one is telling you anything because, frankly, Mom, it's none of your business. My son leaves his wife and my grandchildren, she began to raise her voice, and tells me that this is none of my business, H.M. Susan came and saved me. She wants what's best, she said, leading me to the children. I know, I said. Everyone thinks I'm a scoundrel because I don't tell you what our problems are, and if I don't tell you, they can't believe that it's not my fault. But if I tell them, it will greatly affect the children. God, Susan, this is killing me. I regret that I came. I grabbed another beer and went out into the garden with the kids. Alex, who saw and heard everything, even looked at me with sympathy. I sat with them and talked about school and their friends. Maddie even asked about Sarah. 
Bob and Wendy came out to talk to me. Well, said Bob, Wendy told me that you had changed, but if she hadn't told me, I wouldn't have recognized you. What happened to my nerdy brother? He met a woman who saw him as more than just a nerd, I answered. She did a great job, Bob said, and then, a little awkwardly, he added, You're right when you told Mum it's none of our business, but you have to understand, Harry, we only want to help, and we can't do that if we don't know what the problem is. I understand, I said. I would gladly tell everything, if only so that people would stop considering me the devil incarnate. But if I do, everything will change forever, and I'm not ready for that. I'd rather walk on cloven hooves. He smiled and simply said, You know where to find us, Harry. Don't get lost. Sometimes it's surprising where support comes from. Susan's mother, Elaine, never thought I was right for her daughter. She wanted Susan to marry some social worker who was supposedly destined for great things. Now he was in charge of the Child Protection Department. Elaine didn't care that I made twice as much as this social worker, I was an engineer, and therefore not worthy of her daughter. John was Susan's stepfather, her father died young. While Elaine didn't even acknowledge my existence, John came and sat opposite me in the garden. She's not a bad person, Harry, she's just weak sometimes, but she's not bad. Who are we talking about, John? If you're talking about Elaine, I'm afraid I don't agree with you. Oh, Susan, you fool, he said with a smile. I only know what she told me, that it was all her fault and that she hurt you deeply. Elaine doesn't believe it, of course, but I've never seen Susan admit to something she didn't do. She really loves you, Harry, always has. The only time I saw her stand up to her mother was when you proposed marriage to her. Elaine was on edge for weeks after she said yes. I can imagine, I said with a smile. You're a good person, Harry, he continued, and you spend your life solving problems for one company after another. Think about it, Harry, are you sure you can't find a solution to this problem too? I don't want to see you be one of those sad divorced men who take their kids to the park or zoo every other week. You deserve better. I got us both another beer, and we sat talking about my work, the state of the world, anything but Susan and me. However, his words kept coming back to me. Wasn't I already one of those sad people who sees their kids once every two weeks? John stayed with me for quite some time until Elaine came over and said it was time to go. As he stood up, he suddenly grabbed the table to steady himself. God, Harry, how strong this beer is, he said, referring to beer. I looked at the label. 6.6% alcohol, I said. Oh my God, we drank three or four bottles. That's it, Elaine, dear, you'll be driving today, he said and handed her the keys. He winked at me as they left. John's words kept running through my head. I saw the men he was talking about at the park, the zoo, or McDonald's, desperately trying to find something interesting to do to keep their children occupied in the few short hours they saw them. Just the thought of it made me reach for another bottle of beer, and then another. By the time the rest of the guests had left, Maddie told Susan that she thought Dad was sick because he was talking kind of weird. Susan came out and helped me get up and walk home. I sat on the couch and just let the world pass me by. She put Maddie and Jacob to bed, and then even Alex went to his room, leaving the two of us alone. It's time for me to go, I said. Harry, you can't go in this state. Stay here, she said. No, I'll call a taxi, I answered. It's half past ten on a Friday evening. All taxis are busy in the city center, transporting clubbers and drinkers. No one will travel that far to take you to the other side of town. Stay here for the night. It's your home after all. Okay, just bring me a blanket and a pillow. I'll sleep on the couch, I said. Nothing of the sort, she replied. I've been holding space in bed for you for the last six months, and you won't let it go to waste. Susan supported me on my left side and the staircase railing on my right as I reached the bedroom. I was awakened by the sound of voices outside the bedroom door. The door slowly opened and Jacob and Maddie walked into the room. Maddie was carrying a tray with two cups of coffee and a plate full of Marmite toast. Breakfast, she said. Thank you very much, I replied. Did you do it all yourself? Yes, Maddie said. 
Alex said your car is still here and that if we're good, you'll stay with us today. Will you stay, Dad? Will you stay with us today? I don't know, because today is not my turn, so it's probably better to ask your mother. Susan was still lying under the sheet pulled up to her neck. Your dad can stay with us as long as he wants, she said. When the children left the room, I took a cup of coffee, looked at Susan, and asked, And how often does this happen here these days? About as often as I wake up naked, she said. I have to say, Harry, even when you're drunk, you're doing pretty well. At the children's suggestion, we decided to go on a picnic in the forest. We took Susan's car and loaded it with three of the kids' bikes. I offered to stop by the house to pick up my bike and Sarah's bike so we could all have fun. When we arrived at the house, Susan looked at him in surprise. Five minutes later, we had already loaded two other bicycles and headed into the forest. We had a picnic by the river and rode through the forest. Susan quickly got tired and she and I walked. When she saw Alex rushing down the hill, maneuvering through the trees, she screamed in horror. I dropped the bike and ran to hug her. He needs to be more careful now, Harry, and so do you, she sobbed. We can't wrap it in cotton wool, I told her. He's a teenager, and we have to let him be a teenager. I took her back to the car and sat with her until she calmed down. We all had a good time and went home with three tired kids. Susan made us a warm chicken salad for dinner, and Jacob and Maddie went to bed a little after eight. When Alex went to his room around half past ten, I prepared to leave. Susan rushed to me and hugged me tightly. Please, Harry, could you stay with me today? I really need to cuddle with you. I felt dizzy. I could justify last night by saying I was drunk. If I stay today, it will be because I consciously decided to stay. Susan, I said, if I stay today, it won't change anything for us. I'll leave in the morning anyway. I'll still be with Sarah on Monday. There are more problems in our relationship than one night in the same bed can solve. I know all that, Harry, she replied. I'm not trying to seduce you with sex, although if I thought it would work, I would try. Today I realized how vulnerable you are now, and so does Alex. I may not have time to play the long game and hope that you will come back to me. I just want one more night, Harry, because I don't know if it could be the last. I put my arm around her and, as we walked towards the stairs and then into the bedroom, I reminded her of everything the doctors had told us about being able to lead a full, active life and assured her that I intended to make the most of the pension plan in which I invest money. Once we were in the bedroom, Susan became a completely different person. A few seconds later, we were already making love. In the morning. Thank you for staying, Harry, she said. It was wonderful, wasn't it? Yes, Susan, it was really wonderful. But I don't know what I'll tell Sarah now. Harry, we're still husband and wife. What happens between us is no one's business. I suddenly felt very irritated. There you go again, Susan, I said, trying to keep everything a secret. Haven't you learned anything in the last six months? I have a relationship with Sarah, and I'm not going to deceive her. She may not want to deal with me anymore, but that's a risk I'm willing to take. She shed tears. Sorry, Harry, I didn't think so. I drove back to the house that I had come to consider my real home and berated myself for what I had done. I should have left last night. Yes, it was a wonderful night, and it brought back all my old desires for Susan. I've always loved making love to her, but last night's liberated Susan was even better. However, sex is not everything. I spent Sunday at work, trying to figure out what to say to Sarah. In a way, Susan was right. There is no reason why I can't make love to my wife. But I told Sarah I loved her, and now I felt like I had cheated on her. The only thing left to do was to tell her everything on Monday morning and accept what she decided. That Monday Sarah arrived at my place around half past nine. I said I needed to talk to her. We sat down at the dinner table and Sarah looked worried. I have to tell you, I began, I slept with Susan on Friday and Saturday. I was drunk on Friday, but I have no excuse for Saturday. She sat looking at me for a few minutes and then said, Is that all? You slept with your wife, so what? Aren't you angry? 
Harry, I already told you that I accept the fact that you will probably always love Susan. This means that from time to time you will want to make love to her. I can live with that, Harry. If the choice is between sharing you with someone or not having you at all, I already know what choice I will make. Now tell me about your day off. I told her about the party and the conversations I had with my mother and brother. Told her about Susan's mother and the conversation with John, her stepfather. That's why you got drunk? She asked. I nodded. Well, I'm not surprised, Harry. What surprises me more is that she still hasn't even told her parents what she did. I know you'll defend her, but it's not right that she still lets you take all the blame. I took her by both hands and pulled her into a hug. I need to do some shopping, I said. Let's go and have lunch somewhere at the same time. We went, did some shopping, had lunch at a restaurant, and just enjoyed our time together. When we got back, we just cuddled on the couch. Before Sarah left to pick up the kids from school, I told her I had an appointment tomorrow and wouldn't be back until lunch. It's okay, Harry. By the way, I also have some things to do tomorrow, she said. Susan wasn't expecting any visitors that morning, so when the doorbell rang, she was a little surprised. Her first thought was that maybe it was me, but her surprise became complete when she opened the door and saw Sarah. Sarah, on the other hand, knew exactly why she came. She didn't wait for an invitation and simply pushed past Susan into the house. Good morning, Susan. We need to talk, she said. What the hell are you doing? asked Susan. You can't barge into my house with any demands. Oh, I can, and I've already done it. So what, will you call the police to kick me out or talk to me? asked Sarah. Susan led her into the living room. Would you like some coffee? she asked. No, thank you. Sarah replied, I came here to talk, not to make small talk. And what do you want to talk about? asked Susan. I think it's obvious. I came to ask when will you finally take responsibility for what you did to Harry? Indignation was clearly audible in Sarah's voice. I already took it, Susan replied. I told everyone it was my fault. Not enough, Sarah objected. You didn't tell anyone what exactly you did, not even your parents. No one believes that St. Susan could have done anything to justify Harry's behavior. How about letting him raise other people's children thinking they are his? When will you tell them about this? Susan burst into tears, but Sarah was not going to give in. Stop crying, Susan, she said. It might work with Harry, but not with me. Poor Harry has to endure the fact that everyone, even his own mother, thinks he is guilty. He doesn't tell anyone because he thinks about how it will affect you and the children. He can't bear the thought of people hating you. What's your excuse? Why can't you even tell Alex? He thinks I'm the reason Harry didn't come back to you, but we both know it's because of what you did. I can't tell Alex, it will break him, Susan sobbed. Come on, Susan. You don't tell him because he might start treating you the same way he now treats his father. Yes, I still call Harry his father because, in Harry's opinion, he always has been. But everyone will hate me, said Susan. Isn't that better than letting them hate Harry for something that isn't his fault? Yes, of course it's better, said Susan, holding back tears. I told him on Sunday that I was a selfish bitch, and now I'm being that way again, right? I'm not arguing with you, Sarah said. The fact is that only you can do something about it. Susan began to cry again, and Sarah's compassionate nature came out. She left Susan crying and went to the kitchen to make coffee. She found everything she needed in the closets, and when she returned to the living room, Susan was already wiping away tears. Sarah put the coffee on the table and sat down next to her. Remember those parties we went to when it was dark everywhere and everyone was touching each other? asked Sarah. Susan smiled slightly. Yes, I remember. I've always hated them. When I finally told Harry about it, we stopped going. I was always so jealous of you back then, Sarah said. You were smart, attractive, and everyone loved you. And what's worse, you had. The only decent man in the whole company. My mother would disagree with you on this point, Susan said, taking a sip of her coffee. Then your mother is a fool, Sarah replied. Not only an idiot, but also a terrible snob. Susan added. 
she still hasn't forgiven Harry for being born in a working-class area. They both laughed. Or because he's an engineer, Susan continued. They continued to reminisce about the past, and the atmosphere gradually softened. By the time Sarah was ready to leave, they were already talking like old friends again. At the door, Sarah turned around and said, Susan, do you really love Harry? I can't imagine my life without him, Susan answered. Then you know what you need to do, Sarah said and left. I was sitting in the waiting room of Gordon McCurry, Sarah's father. He made me wait twenty minutes. When the secretary said that he was ready to see me, I couldn't help but feel nervous. I entered his office and saw a man of average height, slightly overweight, about fifty or sixty years old. He had blue eyes and thick gray hair. His handshake was like a grip of steel. Good afternoon, Mr. Anderson, he said, looking at my business card lying on the table. Since I have no interest in telecommunications or manufacturing, I guess it's not a matter of business. No, sir, this is not for business. I came to talk about your daughter, Sarah, I replied. Oh, my daughter, he said with a wide smile. If you came to ask for her hand in marriage, then you are sixteen years too late. No, sir, that's not what I'm after. Do you realize how unhappy her marriage is? I asked. She made her choice, Mr. Anderson, and now she must live with him. But she didn't do it, did she, sir? It was you who insisted that she marry that scoundrel Gary Dawson, threatening her that if she gave birth to a child out of wedlock, she would not receive your support and communication. Well, judging by your precise description, you know my son-in-law well, Mr. Anderson. But what you and I think about him doesn't matter. Having children out of wedlock is a sin in my church. And what does your church say about keeping a young woman in a loveless marriage for sixteen years? I asked. His face turned red with anger, but he still answered. You're getting very close to the edge, Mr. Anderson. I can destroy you at any moment. No, you can't, I said. You yourself said that you have no interest in the areas in which I work. Plus, I'm damn good at what I do. My clients will quickly tire of paying twice as much for a solution that is twice as bad. Okay, Mr. Anderson, what do you want from me? I want you to support Sarah as she divorces Gary Dawson and gets back on her feet, I said. No way, he growled. My grandchildren need a father. Why now? I objected. They didn't have a father for all these sixteen years. Gary wasn't their father, he just lived with them as a guest. Ask them about him, his tastes and preferences. They don't know because he never talks to them. Yes, they need a father, but I'm sure she'll find someone better than Gary. Look, I'm offering you the opportunity to rebuild your relationship with your daughter, because if you don't support her, I will. Maybe not on the same level as you but I will help her get a divorce and finish her education so she can support herself. You're starting to annoy me, Mr. Anderson, he growled. I think it's time for you to leave. When I need your opinion on family matters, I will ask you. He pressed a button on the table. Mr. Anderson is leaving, Jennifer. Please see him out. I stood up to go to the door, but stopped briefly. Will it change anything if I say that your son-in-law ruined my happy 17-year marriage with his infidelity? Is this your marriage, Mr. Anderson? he asked. Yes, sir. In that case, you have my sympathy, he replied. Jennifer came in and walked me to the exit. When we reached the door, McCurry called out to me. Mr. Anderson, how did you meet my son-in-law? One school, one district, I answered. And yet you, Mr. Anderson, are a completely different breed, he said. Thank you, sir, I'll take it as a compliment, I replied. Jennifer actually showed me the way out, and I headed home, hoping that I had made some impact on the situation, although he didn't give me much reason to be optimistic. The next day, neither Sarah nor I discussed our activities from the previous day. I asked Sarah what she would do if she had the chance to divorce Gary. She replied that she would jump at the chance, and then I told her that if her father did not support her, I would. I said that I could not support her at the same level as her father. Harry, she asked, isn't this a marriage proposal? No, I'm sorry if it sounded like that, I said. I just want to say that no matter what happens to us, 
I will help you with your divorce and your studies. And what kind of study will it be, Harry? Well, I thought you'd want to pick up where you left off to gain some independence. Harry, that's a great idea. Do you really think I can? I'm sure you can, I replied. Harry, you are so good for me, she said and kissed me. This weekend, it was my turn to pick up the kids, so I picked them up as usual, and as usual, Alex decided not to go. I won't lie it hurt me, but it had to be his decision. Perhaps John's words about park dads touched me, and I decided we'd just stay home. Sarah came to us in the afternoon. Jacob and Maddie were good to her, so there were no problems. We had a great time at home, and by evening the kids were tired. It started to rain and Sarah sat down with me to have a glass of wine. I wanted her to stay, but around ten she left. She had been gone for no more than five minutes when the doorbell rang. My heart sank when I saw Alex, soaked to the skin, on the threshold. I let him in and gave him towels to dry. Does your mom know you're here? I asked. He shook his head. I saw how cold he was, so I made him take off his clothes and get in the shower to warm up. While he was in the shower, I called Susan. Hello, Susan. I thought it best to call you. Alex just got here. He was wet to the skin and cold. I put him in the shower to warm him up. Oh, thank God, Harry. I was so worried. Thanks for calling. What happened, Susan? I asked. I told him everything, Harry, everything. It was around noon. He was so angry with me and ran away. I didn't think he would come to you. I called all his friends. Don't worry, Susan, he's here. I'll take care of him and bring him back tomorrow with the others. In the meantime, rest. Thank you, Harry, thank you. Good night. Good night, Susan. I grabbed a robe for Alex and asked him to come down when he was dry. Meanwhile, I put the kettle on and made him a cup of hot chocolate. Gradually, he warmed up. I sat down next to him on the sofa. Okay, Alex, let's start from the beginning. What is this all about? I asked. I'm sorry, Dad, I'm sorry, I really am, he sobbed. Sorry about what? I asked. For thinking that it couldn't be that serious, and that you were just using it as an excuse to be with Sarah. You never told me that, I said. I know, but I still thought so. I just couldn't understand why you couldn't give your mom another chance, but she ruined your life, Dad. I mean, you might not even be my father. Anyone else would be long gone, but you're still here. Let's no longer talk about the fact that I'm not your father. What other father did you know? I asked. Only you, and I was such a bastard towards you. And then you go and give me your kidney. I don't deserve this. He sobbed his fingers tracing the scar on my back. It's your bad back in the hospital, isn't it? Why did you hide this from me? I did this because I love you. I didn't want you to think I did it so you would love me, so I asked your mom not to tell you until everything was settled, I told him. Why did she do that, Dad? Why did she hurt you like that? He asked. I remembered John's words at the party. Susan is not a bad woman, Alex. She didn't do it to hurt me. She did it to get you. She shouldn't have done this, but she's weak and desperate. It's very difficult for a woman who wants children as much as your mother. When someone offers an easy solution, it's hard to refuse. But she did it again twice, he said. We talked about the situation, and he calmed down. I finally put him to bed put his clothes in the dryer, and went to bed myself. Sleep didn't come easily. I couldn't understand why Susan suddenly decided to tell him everything. I was glad she did it, but still curious as to why and what would happen next. We had a good day on Sunday. There was a big motorcycle rally nearby, and Sarah brought Luke and Daisy. The older boys really enjoyed looking at the motorcycles. Even walking through the parking lot was exciting for them. The girls and Sarah also enjoyed the activities and admired some of the bikers. I was completely immersed at the moment when my cell phone rang. It was Susan's phone. Hi, Susan, I said. What's happened? It's not Susan, Harry, it's John, said the voice on the other end. Susan is here, but she's in no condition to talk to you right now. What do you mean, John? 
What happened? Is she okay? I asked. Sorry, I guess I scared you, he said. Physically, she's fine. She's just very upset. I just wanted to call and tell him what happened. I looked around and found a bench to sit on. Okay, John, what's the matter? She told us everything, Harry. She told me about everything. About the syringe, about the kidney, about everything. Elaine is shocked. I know I shouldn't feel this way, Harry, but seeing Elaine broken and drowning this time made me happy. Are you still here, Harry? Yeah, sorry, John. I'm just trying to make sense of what's going on. She told Alex about it yesterday. Well, Elaine started this fight, John said. She went on her usual tirade about how Susan shouldn't have married you and how you weren't worthy of her. Susan, this time, couldn't hold back. She said Elaine was right. She shouldn't have married you because you deserve someone much better than her lying and unfaithful daughter. And then everything came out. Elaine is just sitting here and doesn't know what to do. Susan locked herself in the bathroom. I just sat there in silence. Harry, John said. The main reason for my call is to find out when you will be back with the children. I don't think Susan is fit to drive, so I'll take her home. Can you stay with her? I said I could and hung up. When I stood up, Sarah, Daisy, and Maddie quickly found me. Sarah asked what happened, and I told her. What's happening? I asked. First Alex, now her parents. Then I panicked and called John again. John, I said. A thought just occurred to me. It looks like she decided to tell everything. Please tell her from me that under no circumstances should she tell my mother or brother about this. Now you know the truth. Think what this could do to our children. I don't want them to lose their grandmother. When I put the phone in my pocket, Sarah took my hand and pressed me. Come on, let's take you to a barbecue. We had a great day. Being with Sarah was wonderful in itself but having all five children added to the joy. We returned home to eat, and Sarah and the children went to their place. I told Jacob, Maddie, and Alex that their mother was very upset, and that Grandma Elaine and Grandpa John would be home when I picked them up. Alex said he didn't want to go. He wanted to stay with me. I told him it wouldn't be fair to leave while his mom was so upset. When we arrived, we were greeted by John and the silent Elaine. Elaine busied herself getting Maddie and Jacob to bed. Alex went to his room. I went up to Susan. She saw me when I came in and smiled. I walked over and sat down next to her on the bed. I brushed her hair away from her face. I told them, Harry, she said. Yes, I replied. You definitely told them everything. They don't blame you anymore, she said. I think you need to sleep, I said. Where's Alex, she asked. Alex is in his room, and I'm staying here for the night, so just rest. You'll feel better in the morning. I kissed her and left her to sleep. Downstairs, John and Elaine were sitting on the sofa. I offered them coffee or a glass of wine. Elaine refused both. Tugging at her hands and looking at the floor, she came up to me. Harry, she said, I owe you an apology. I thought very badly about you and even said that you were not worthy of my daughter. Now I find out that she broke your heart, but despite that, and despite the fact that you didn't know if he was your son, you still saved the life of our eldest grandson. You are not only worthy of my daughter, we will be proud if you decide to remain our son-in-law. Well, Elaine, I said, I can't say that I'm not touched by your words, but I have to correct you on one thing. Alex is my son, and I love him. I am the only father he has ever known, and I intend to remain one. Same goes for Maddie and Jacob. Thank you, she said and returned to John, wiping away her tears. They stayed with me for a short time, and I assured them that I would stay the night. As they left, John put his arm around my shoulders. Well done, lad, he said, and thank you for your kindness. It wasn't easy for her to say that. When I returned to Susan, she was already asleep. I undressed her and covered her. I kissed her gently on the forehead, took a pillow, and went down to sleep on the sofa. This morning I called Sarah to let her know that I would be back later as I planned to take the kids to school. She was busy herself, so the conversation was short. I went up to check on Susan. 
she was still sleeping so I started getting the kids up. I fed them all and got them ready for school before she came downstairs. I kissed her forehead and went to take the kids to school. When I returned, she was already dressed, and except for her tired look, she looked almost as usual. She prepared coffee and we sat down to drink it. What made you tell everyone? I asked. I saw that until I did this, they would continue to blame you, Harry, and that was not fair. I told her what her mother said. Finally, she said, she never gave you a chance, arrogant cow. John is normal, but my mother thinks everyone is beneath us. Well, it looks like you cured her, I said. Harry, did you know that we will have to do paternity tests? If not for you, then for the children. They have the right to know who their biological father is. I guess so, I said, but I don't want to know the result. Why? Wouldn't this help you find out the truth? She asked. Think about it, Susan. What if one of them is mine and the others are his? Where does that leave me? I'd like to think that it won't change anything and that I'll love them all equally, but I can't guarantee that. What about you? Can you treat everyone the same? I think it's better not to know. I ruined everything, didn't I? She said. I looked at my watch and said that I had to go because Sarah was waiting. I kissed her goodbye and left, thinking about my problems and trying to find a solution. Sarah looked happier than ever when I saw her. She came into the house and prepared breakfast for me. I bet you haven't eaten yet, she said. As usual, she was right. Over breakfast, she told me how much she, Luke and Daisy had enjoyed our day. Luke, she said, was amazed at my knowledge of motorcycles, and he and Alex got along well. Everyone enjoyed our day. Then she told me another piece of news. Dad was waiting for us when we got home last night, she said. He asked me about my marriage, and I laughed and said, What marriage? It was strange. He actually showed interest. He even asked Luke and Daisy about their father. I was shocked. They couldn't even remember his birthday. He was very nice, not at all the way he usually is with me. He said that if I could find evidence of infidelity, he would pay for the divorce and continue to support me after that. When he asked what I would do after the divorce, I told him about our plans, that I was going to go to university and complete my education. You know, Harry, he really liked this idea. He said that I would be the smartest and most beautiful girl on campus. I didn't even want him to leave which, as you know, is unusual for me. Where was Gary all this time? I asked. I don't know, in some casino. I think the fact that he didn't show up helped Dad make his decision. What did you have? She asked me. I told her everything. About Susan's mother, about how I put Susan to bed and slept on the sofa. When I mentioned paternity tests, Sarah's eyes lit up. Here's my proof, she said. If only one of them is Gary's kid, I have dirt on him. Can I do this, Harry, please? Tears streamed down my face, and I simply nodded. Everyone seemed to be pushing me to get paternity tests. Okay, I said, but just make sure I don't find out the results. She looked at me and, seeing my condition, pressed me to her chest. I think at that moment I made a decision. Sorry, Sarah, I said, but I can't do this anymore. I can't be a weekend dad anymore. They need me. I have to go back. Are you serious, Harry? Are you really going back to Susan? She asked. I'm going back to my children, I said. And yes, I go back to Susan. They need me. But I need you too, Harry, especially now that I'm getting divorced. Honestly, you're the main reason I want this. Is it because of her sudden confession? She's just trying to win you back by making you feel sorry for her. No, that's not the point. It's Sunday. It was a great day and everyone was happy. But I should be able to do it whenever I want, not just when it's my turn. I should be there when they get home, but I'm not. I really love you, Sarah, but I can't leave my children for you, and I can't be with you and still keep them. We sat hugging and crying until the tears dried up. Can we still see each other, Harry? She asked. I don't think so, I said. I can't look at you without wanting to get you into bed. I don't think Susan will like it. When will you be back? She asked. Saturday, I replied. Then we have four days, she said. Let's go to bed. 
That day set the tone for the entire week. Between school trips, we spent all our time together. Sometimes we went out, but more often we made love. In the evenings, I visited the children. Every evening, Susan asked me to stay, but every evening I returned home. Friday, the day I was so afraid of, came faster than I would have liked. And of course, she came. Sarah and I cried as we said goodbye. She tried to persuade me to continue everything as it was. As we parted, Sarah made her final move. I won't leave, she said. If there are any more skeletons in the closet, I will wait. I will gladly accept all your children. I'm even ready to share with you if possible. I love you, Harry Anderson, and I will not give up on you. With these words, she got into the car and drove away. After Sarah left, I called Charlotte to let her know I could no longer look after the house and to set up an appointment to do the inventory. That evening, when I went to see Susan and the kids, I told Alex and Jacob that I needed to move out of the house I was living in and asked if they could help me. Both were very happy. Maddie said I was being sexist by not including her, so I ended up getting help from all three of them. The next morning, I pulled up at 9.30, and all three of us were ready and enthusiastic. I drove them to the house, and they helped me pack my bags, computer, and books. We put everything in the trunk. Maddie said goodbye to the house. I deliberately took the bypass road so that the children would not understand where I was going. When we finally parked at their own house, they were puzzled until Alex said, Daddy's coming home. We got out of the car, and for the first time in six months, I used my keys to open the door. Susan saw us and asked Maddie, So, honey, where is Daddy's new house? Here, Mom. Dad is moving here, she replied. I looked at Susan. If you don't mind, I said. She rushed to me and hugged me. Of course I don't mind. This is the day I've been waiting for six months. The first few days were a little strange as everyone was trying to make me feel welcome. Susan's parents came to visit and I was treated to effusive compliments from Elaine and a few beers from John. When things calmed down a bit, I decided that I wanted to work on a project with the boys. One of my clients bought a farm and discovered a 1964 Velocet Venom Clubman motorcycle in the barn. He was in a terrible state, but he said that he was mine if I wanted him. When it arrived and I told everyone we would be restoring it, the boys were delighted. Susan didn't particularly like motorcycles, but she played along and told Maddie that her job was to photograph the process. This project was a great way to bond with Alex. Jacob also participated, but quickly lost interest. When Sarah called to ask to bring the children for paternity tests, Susan answered the call. Everything could be done at home, but the laboratory required identification. Susan took all three of them away with their documents. My life with Susan was going well, and our sex life couldn't have been better, but I still couldn't get Sarah out of my head. I started going to the same gym at the same time as before, hoping to see her in her short shorts. I worked hard, hoping it would push her out of my thoughts, but as soon as I let my mind wander, she would appear again. I began to lose my appetite and my sleep became very restless. I started losing weight. It was around this time that I began to notice changes in Susan. She started going to the gym with me and also started losing weight. She got a new haircut and changed her makeup. She began to dress differently younger, sexier. She started going out more and some of the purchases on her credit card were from London shops. If it weren't for the fact that our sex life was so good, I would have suspected that she was having an affair. But since everything was going so well, I didn't even ask her about it. Everything lost meaning when I felt empty inside. It's been almost two months since I left Sarah and returned home. I thought it would get easier over time, but everything remained just as hard as before. One of my clients got tickets to the Superbike World Championship in Donington. I took Alex and Sarah's son Luke with me, but when I arrived to pick up Luke, I had to wait in the car. I didn't trust myself to even be in the same room with her. When we returned, Susan had a surprise for me. I invited Sarah to dinner on Friday night, she said. She needs to discuss something with you. I was a little worried. You just want to see how long I can go without looking at her, I said. Her answer surprised me. 
I don't care if you take her upstairs and sleep with her, as long as you don't leave me again. The week flew by quickly, and then Friday arrived. The children chose to have dinner at the usual time, six o'clock. Susan changed for dinner, and I couldn't believe my eyes. She came down wearing a dark red satin dress with a plunging neckline that showed off her breasts and a flowing skirt. As I ran my hand over her back, I noticed something unusual. What, are you without underwear? I asked. Yes, she replied. It ruins the fit of the dress. Alex was just about to leave when the doorbell rang. He opened it and saw Sarah. Hi, Alex, she said. How are you? Very good, thank you, Alex replied. I was just about to leave, but please come in. Dad is waiting for you. I rose to meet her. She smiled her big smile. Hey, Harry, did you miss me? Every minute, I replied. Susan called from the kitchen. I helped Sarah take off her coat and looked at her. She wore a silver satin dress with a low neckline that reached almost to her navel. I looked at her and could have sworn that her breasts had gotten bigger. When I looked below, I noticed a small belly. Yes, Harry, you need to talk to your ammunition supplier. Looks like someone slipped you real bullets among the blanks, she said with a smile and placed my hand on her stomach. How much time? I asked. About three months, she replied. Susan came out of the kitchen. I see you've already heard the news, Harry, haven't you? This is wonderful, she said. Yes, that's great, I said. But how is this possible? My doctor says a lot has changed in the last 15 years, Harry. Sarah said with a smile. I'm going to give birth to your baby. Are you happy, Harry? I know I'm happy. Let's talk about this after dinner. Susan suggested, setting the dishes on the table. Susan outdid herself by preparing three courses of culinary masterpieces for us. We talked about my work, Susan's new look, and even the motorcycle restoration project. When it came to coffee, Sarah told me another piece of news. The house I lived in for those six months is now up for sale. It turned out that the family that owned it stayed abroad for a long time and decided to sell it rather than maintain it. The expected price was around £450,000. Susan immediately wanted to buy it and asked if we could afford it. I knew it would be hard, but if we sold our current home, it would be possible, and I agreed to look into it. The conversation then turned to Sarah's pregnancy. You're glad about this, aren't you, Harry? She asked. Yes, I am very happy, but you must understand that this complicates an already difficult situation. Honestly, it's hard for me to cope with what's already happening. Now I have a strong desire to take you to bed, I said. I looked at Susan for a reaction, but saw nothing. I'm not sure I can handle meeting you regularly, and even worse, I'll be a father again only for the weekend. It seemed like I was the only one who cared. Susan and Sarah looked at each other, and this time it was Susan who spoke. We think you're approaching this problem from the wrong angle, Harry. You're trying to exclude Sarah from our marriage, and look where it gets you. When you and I are alone, everything is as beautiful as always. In fact, even better, because I now enjoy the way you please me, just as you always enjoyed pleasing me. However, I know that when I'm not around you are unhappy. I saw tears in your eyes. I see how you try to occupy your life with something to avoid thinking about Sarah. We think that instead of kicking her out of your life, you should lock her inside. I couldn't believe my ears. Was she really offering what would be a dream for many men? I sat silently for a while. Are you seriously suggesting? Buy a bigger bed, Susan said, interrupting me. Of course, if you need a bigger bed, then the house needs to be bigger, especially if Sarah and her children are going to live with us. Sarah looked at me expectantly. What do you think, Harry? Would you like me to become your second wife? I know this will raise a lot of questions, but we can work through it. If you can handle my father, you can handle anyone. Oh, I said, so you know about it. Are you kidding? He can't stop talking about you. Harry Anderson, a man of steel, she said, trying to imitate her father's Scottish accent. So, what do you think, Harry? asked Susan. It looks like you've already thought of everything, I said. 
But are you sure that the two of you can get along in such a situation? Where do you think I've been for the last month? asked Susan. Sarah gave me the same attention she gave you, and we became like sisters. Moreover, we have something in common. We're both very much in love with you. What could I say? I agreed. They both stood up, hugged, and kissed me. We were still hugging when Alex returned. He looked at us and then at the ceiling with an expression that said, Grown-ups, what should we do with them? When everything calmed down, Sarah handed me the envelope. I opened it and saw that these were results from a DNA laboratory. I don't want to know, I said. Read it, Harry, Sarah almost shouted. I started reading. The main part of the letter was presented in the form of a table. Paternity test. Alleged Father Gary Dawson. Alexander Anderson. Probability less than 0.1%. Madeline Anderson. Less than 0.1% chance. Jacob Anderson. Less than 0.1% chance. I was stunned. Then Susan handed me another envelope. After what I did, Harry, I realized that I had no right to expect you to believe that no one else was there, so I used your old toothbrush as a sample and did another test, she said. This test followed the same pattern, only Harry Anderson was listed as the alleged father. Alexander Anderson, probability more than 99.9%. Madeline Anderson, more than 99.9% .9 probability. Jacob Anderson, more than 99.9% .9 probability. They're all yours, Harry, Sarah said. Now for a little relaxation, Sarah said and handed me another envelope. Inside was an invitation on thick paper with a gold border that read, Mr. Gordon McCurry and his wife Elizabeth invite Mr. and Mrs. Harry Anderson to Mr. McCurry's 60th birthday celebration. I can't go there, I said. The last time I saw him, he kicked me out. He said that's what you'd say, so he wrote something personal on the back, Sarah said. He said you'll understand what it means. On the back of the invitation was written, I am asking. Get more business cards, Harry. I think he has a business proposition for you. Thus ended the most difficult year of my life. Sarah's father actually proposed to me, and we are about to open our own business and its services consulting company. My two wives, as I now think of them, live with me and our families in the large house in which I lived during the separation. Luke has joined Alex and I in restoring the bike, and we hope to have it on display by August. Gary didn't contest the divorce, so he never found out that all our evidence was a bluff. I would like to tell what happened to him, but to be honest, I don't care so much that I don't even want to find out. Armed with evidence, Susan told my mother everything that had happened. Mom somehow accepted it because her grandchildren are still her grandchildren. John and Elaine still visit us. John says, I always knew you would find a solution. Of course, the truth is that I didn't find anything. The real surprise was Elaine, she continues to treat me well and calls our situation avant-garde. If I were a vengeful person, I would say that my revenge has taken place. Not only did I sleep with Gary's wife, I got her pregnant. I took his family and deprived him of his livelihood. However, I am not a vindictive person, and all I see is that if none of this had happened, I would not have Sarah in my life, and I would not be looking forward to the birth of our daughter, another child who will call me Daddy. And the word Dad is perhaps the best word in the English language. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. 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 Click to the next one.